presentation this evening is a presentation on UNCW's All Blue Initiative, and at this time I'd like to recognize Ms. Joan Keston, who is the advisor for that group. Uh, good evening, and thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation today. Uh, my name is Joan Keston. I'm an attorney and on the advisory board to the Alliance for a Blue Economy, which we refer to as All Blue. Over one and a half years ago, a group of volunteers from the university and the community met at the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at UNCW, forming an initiative to grow and further develop the blue economy in the greater Wilmington area. Wilmington is uniquely situated to become a major global blue economy hub. You will see from today's presentation that the blue economy is much broader and essential than you probably realize. As leaders in our community, you need to know about our initiative and how this could be the greatest economic development strategy for Wellington to date. Your awareness and support are critical for the blue economy and protection of our precious competitive advantage to become a major global blue economy hub. I would like to introduce other members with us today. Heather McWhorter will be doing the pre presentation. Heather is the interim director of the UNC Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship and the Regional Director of the UNC Small Business and Technology Development Center. Heather is a licensed environmental engineer and has committed her career to serving entrepreneurs and innovators to advance regional communities and sustainability issues. Susan Bales is one of our impressive All Blue volunteers. She has a 30 plus year career as a forward thinking innovation practitioner in ocean science, engineering, and policy, both in the US and abroad for both the federal and private sector agencies. Today, Susan is a mentor and executive coach to students, startups, and industry. She is well known for economic techno technical influence and diverse sections of the blue economy. Cordelia Norris is the owner and leader of a design, design firm called Luna Creative, which is a Wilmington-based firm focused on sustainability. She, you'll see all of her materials today in the presentation. It's, they're great. Also from the university tonight are Stuart Borett, Associate Provost for Research and Innovation at UNCW, Kenneth Halanich, the Executive Director of the UNC Center for Marine Science, and Mark Lanier, Assistant to the Chancellor and Assistant Secretary to the UNC Board of Trustees. I have placed at each of your seats information seat, sheet as well as a press release about All Blue. Thank you very much. Thank you. In spring of 2020, a group of like-minded individuals from across the Cape Fear region and UNCW convened to discuss issues and opportunities emerging along the North Carolina coast. The discussions focused on the unique characteristics of our coastal area, our access to high quality environments, productive estuaries that support fish and birds, clean water, in open areas that support quick recovery following storms. We discussed our workforce of skilled workers who show up and get the job done, of eager graduates, of innovative entrepreneurs, and of experienced managers and respected industry leaders. We discussed our culture of welcoming people who care for our region and want to share the place we call home. With these discussions, we developed a vision for our region's future that involves good paying jobs, innovative businesses, and a sustainable environment. The vision will capitalize on the best of who we are, including the fact that we were recently named 81st in the world as a startup community by Startup Genome. Thank you for allowing me to join you tonight and talk to you about all blue economy. So tonight I will be um, talking a little bit about what the blue economy is, why here, why now, what we've done so far, and what we're focusing on. So what is the blue economy? The Alliance for the Blue Economy, um, or excuse me, the World Bank Group um, describes the blue economy as the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods, and jobs 
while preserving the health of ocean ecosystems. A critical aspect of the blue economy is sustainability. Efforts to grow the economy that are not environmentally sustainable cost time, resources, lead to degradation of critical environments, decline human health, and ultimately are not economically sustainable. The blue economy is a more thoughtful approach. The greater Wilmington region has more than just access to the coast as an asset. We have access to thriving waterways, tidal creek systems, an inland port, and the largest river system in the Carolinas. If you reside in Wilmington on any given day, you have access to beaches, waterways, the ocean, the Gulf Stream, multiple river systems, and unique environments that help fuel the blue economy. These natural elements provide great opportunities for jobs in industry, but they can also provide challenges. The Cape Fear region is uniquely positioned to grow a world-class economy, and we need to make sure we do it in a sustainable way. The strengths of the region are clear. When you stand back and look at our region, you will see a university that focuses on marine science, as well as business and entrepreneurship. You will see community colleges that are also focusing on marine technology and biotech. You will see the right infrastructure in place to make this initiative work. A port, airport, rail, trucking, and logistics companies. And you will see a healthy entrepreneurial ecosystem that is growing to meet the needs of our entrepreneurs and innovators. And please let me repeat it again, because it's something we all need to be pr proud of. We're 81st in the world for our startup ecosystem. I mean, I think we should all pat ourselves on the back for that. So um, when you look across the world, this is a map of blue tech incubators. We hope one day to have Wilmington on this map as well. Two examples I'll highlight. See Ahead is in Boston. They help companies to build. They run a blue tech incubator, facilitate investments in blue startups, and are catalyzing a blue tech cluster in the Northeast. On the other side of the coast, Alta C is at the port of Los Angeles. They focus on accelerating scientific collaboration advancing an emerging blue economy through business innovation and job creation and inspiring the next generation. There are many other examples of how communities are fostering the blue economy in their regions to start and grow blue tech businesses and to support their own vision of how to have a great future. As we continue to have conversations and decide how this initiative can shape our future, in the best ways, we can determine how to shape our own Blue Economy Initiative. Here's some, a few more data points for you, if you don't believe me yet. Um, according to their report, the Port of Wilmington contributes $13 billion to the North Carolina economy through the transport of goods and the jobs they support. Uh, in the middle there, in 2016, there were more than 13,000 ocean-related jobs in New Hanover County alone. And so I looked at census numbers, most recent 2019, we have 103,000 jobs in the county, so that means 13% of them are ocean-related. Finally, current estimates are that the ocean-based economy will grow from $1.5 trillion to $3 trillion by 2030. There's huge growth in this area and specifically in technology. We want our region to be prepared to meet this opportunity and claim a large portion of the expansion. The blue economy is taking shape in our country and region. We have to 
we need to have our local leaders engaged at a number of levels to meet this opportunity. We need to de help determine who develops the new blue technologies, where the new technologies will be developed, and how the technologies will be used. In this quote, the deputy of NOAA states, by supporting the growth of the blue economy, we can help to accelerate the nation's recovery. This belief is leading to multiple federal agencies beginning to invest specifically in community-based blue economy initiatives. We have started by focusing on five sectors, but there is room for more expansion depending on the needs of our region. First, marine robotics. Uh, we're setting to embark on the development of sensors and technology development to support maritime shipping and more. Marine biopharma is the exploration for new medicines from marine environments. Sustainable aquaculture is growing and harvesting fish sustainably. According to the North Carolina Coastal Federation, the shellfish industry is just one sector that has reported an expansion growing from one to five million dollars in the last five years. Sustainable tourism saves millions for the hospitality industry and protects the environment while supporting billions of input into the coastal economy. Finally, focusing on technologies and other improvements in coastal resiliency could save lives and save hundreds of million dollars in recovery costs. This, in a nutshell, is where we were focusing our energy. So regardless of the sector, this is our approach, this is our thought process, informed decision making, focusing on leadership, engaging leadership, education. So we're thinking a lot about carrying what we know back to STEM and educating our youth, engaging the community and engaging, of course, building the right infrastructure for economic development. So even though we're only a little bit more than a year in, we've had some early wins already. Um, and they're listed here. I do want to pause because um, I saw here the, the third bullet is the North Carolina a and partnership that UNCW has um, that our Center for Innovation Entrepreneurship envisioned. On Monday during Cape Fear Minority Enterprise Development Week, we had a session on minorities in marine science and ocean entrepreneurship. In this, engineering students who were getting ready to graduate were reflecting on the ocean-related innovation and product development work that they did with us. During the session, the students admitted that they now understand that instead of starting, say, a service business, they could start an ocean-related technology business someday. This transformation on the next generation of our leaders is remarkable. We need to continue this entrepreneurial mindset thought process throughout our citizens to look for opportunities for all to prosper. Also, if you missed that session, it will be on the Cape Fear MedWeek Facebook page. So I'm almost done. And this is the grand conclusion in our ask um, so we, we would really like um, for you to get involved. Um, so the first week of November, we have our first All Blue Week. It is a conference about the blue economy. Um, as that on November 2nd, that's the, the kickoff date, at UNCW's Lumina Theater at eight o'clock in the morning, we have our opening session. Um, I'm going to highlight three of our special guests. In that opening session, special guest in Wilmington native, Rear Admiral Laura Dickey, operational commander for all US Coast Guard missions from the North Carolina, South Carolina border to New Jersey, will present an insightful update on the U.S. Coast Guard's current activities and future plans and how they will impact coastal North Carolina. Next, we will hear from internationally renowned 
futurist, Deborah Westfall, author of Convergence, Technology, Business, and Human-Centric Future. Ms. Westfall will offer keen insights on the themes of sustainability and human-centric convergence and how they resonate with and are embedded in the blue economy. Closing out the session is John Waterston, who joins us from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, an agency of the US Department of Defense. He will speak about accelerating trends in the collection, communication, and analysis of ocean security and weather information and how actionable data is changing marine science, coastal resiliency, and defense protocol. And all that's just on the first morning of a week long of activities. Mm. Events and activities are live in Eventbrite and will be announced on the All Blue NC Facebook page. Registrations will be also lined up from the website at allbluenc.org and that information is on the handout that you have. So thank you for allowing me to join you on this beautiful evening to discuss the future of our region that capitalizes on the best of who we are. You heard about a vision of our region's future that involves good paying jobs, innovative businesses, and a sustainable environment. My name is Heather McWhorter, and I am from the UNCW Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I hope you can join us on November 2nd. It's very interesting, and I just want to say thank you for the collaboration between the university and the city of Wilmington through its uh, Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I'm just glad to see that the, a, a lot of focus is going to be on our blue economy, especially our oceans and estuaries. And, that is something that uh, I feel that we can generate a lot of business. I know that you folks do a lot of great work over there, a lot of research, uh, and, and it produce a lot of different things over the years. But to see this be ramped up to that we can create jobs and uh, and and businesses here is even even greater. And it's something that uh, I'm glad to see. This is the direction that the university and the in the, in the you know, center is going. I think it makes a lot of sense and. We definitely want to be at the table and be supportive of the initiative because I think it's got a lot of merit and can produce a lot of good paying jobs for our community and for our citizens. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yes, uh, Councilman Barnett. Yeah. Yes. Um, you mentioned that you're going to um, get involved with STEM. How do, how do you propose to do that? Because I would love to see more kids um, get an interest in protecting their environment, protecting the ocean, and learning to live you know, by um, working in this um, all blue economy. And I 100% agree um, as an engineer, so, you know, I'm very fond of that idea. Um, so we already have a, a STEM program for um, educators embedded in, the, in our all blue week. So we're communicating directly with the teachers. Um, but I think longer term, if we think about if we could get a marine robotics site, like a facility in our town. Wouldn't that be awesome mm -hmm. to have the students come and build underwater robotics? Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a game changer for oh, us. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Next item of business is our consent agenda, items one through four. I will ask that item CT be pulled since we will have a short presentation by Dave Mays on that. Do I have a motion to approve this consent agenda, items one through four, excluding item C2? We have a motion to approve by Councilmember Anderson, second by Councilmember O'Grady. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item passes unanimously. At this time, I'm going to ask for Dave Mays uh, to come up and talk about resolution approving the contract for annual needs streets rehabilitation program throughout the city streets network to Highland Paving Company of Fayetteville in the amount of $6,123,858 and, of course, 55 cents. Dave, the floor is yours. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, purpose of the, this presentation is, is basically pretty simple. We want to show you what you're getting for your money. So um, 
as I discussed with you back in March at one of the budget work sessions, um, the pavement condition survey that was completed uh, last year uh, told us that we really need to make sure that we're paying attention uh, to the streets that are in good condition, keeping them in good health in order for us to make sure that the deferred maintenance cost doesn't escalate too far. So the first two tools that I'm going to talk about with you are exactly that. These are tools that we will implement with this contract to make sure that those healthy streets uh, stay healthy for much longer. The first one is uh, under pavement preservation is, is rejuvenation. We like to refer, that, uh, refer to that as basically applying sunscreen to asphalt. It helps um, keep the, uh, the, the moisture from infiltrating into the pavement section, which causes damage to asphalt. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, based on our, the bid price that we got, we'll be, we'll be able to apply that for $1.50 a square yard. That's very affordable uh, for street maintenance. We have identified 82 lane miles within the city based on the criteria that um, these are streets that we have officially accepted through uh, the development process since 2016 and also streets that we have recently resurfaced ourselves, either through in-house or contract methods. Uh, most of these streets would have a, a, an existing or current pavement condition index uh, above 70. So they're in good shape, and uh, again, this is uh, intended to keep them in good shape. The second technique uh, for pavement preservation uh, for keeping our streets healthy uh, is slurry seal. And this is truly a sealant that we apply to, uh, to the asphalt. Uh, Again, as you can see on the screen, uh, it's also fairly affordable at $3.25 per square yard. Um, and this again will help uh, keep those roads uh, that are healthy and good shape. These, uh, these roads are identified as more local streets or residential. Um, they may have some more cracking and that sealant is really there to help seal those cracks and keep the water from intruding into the asphalt pavement section. Um, these roads typically would have a PCI or pavement condition index of greater than, greater than 60, and we've identified about 55 lane miles within uh, the city that we would target that, that technique for. Uh, both of these techniques are uh, included in the, in the cost of the contract, so we will be able to get this part of the work done. Lastly, to update you on resurfacing, which is the more traditional way of, of uh, rehabilitating our streets, it's also the most expensive. You can compare the price that's on the screen, uh, ranging depending on the type of asphalt rehabilitation that we have to do, anywhere from $16.34 up to $35.51 per square yard. So it's quite a bit more expensive to go out there and do milling and, and resurfacing. Uh, so far, we've identified about 28 lane miles that are on our immediate needs, and these streets would be local streets with a pavement condition index of less, less than 60. So these, these are streets that are in worse condition than the first category of, of streets that I mentioned. In addition, it would be uh, collector streets or larger streets carrying a higher volume of traffic that have a PCI of less than 70. Can I ask you a question, David? Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, I know that in the 95 and 98 annexation areas, some of those road uh, that were built under other types of standards, maybe county standards or even lesser standards, as opposed to what the base element is in the road surface, or the road uh, packing or the, the, the sub base there. Um, when y'all are measuring the mill rate, are y'all also looking at the condition of the base of, of the stone and the rock that they put in, like, I guess, some point that it was six six inches, others were four inches, others, and you can see on some of the, some of these roads where the deterioration occurs much quicker because of the base issues. Y yes, sir, and that's a good point. We will typically before we go out there and do full born uh, uh, milling and, and resurfacing, we'll go out there and core the pavement before we do that, so that we know we're, know what we're getting into. And we found all different sorts of pavement sections out there. Some of it, believe it or not, some asphalt sections are just put on subgrade or dirt. Um, and, and in some cases, that's okay because it's, it's held up for this long and it can sustain that. We might go back with a thicker pavement section in that case just to make sure that we're trying to get the most life out of the new pavement as possible. So when we had that 103 inches of rain back door, and I guess when Florence came through that year, I think we broke the national record 
for the amount of rainfall in a particular area. And the sub base of, of, of a lot of these streets that deteriorated to a point where I guess the asphalt is deteriorating quicker because of the sub base. When you all go back out, would you all rebase some of those streets or would you just go ahead and put more asphalt on top of it? Yes, sir, we will. And that is a case by case basis. Uh, a lot of times we can go in and uh, kind of surgically uh, uh, deal with the, the, the worst locations on a street through pavement repair. In other words, we'll cut out a piece of the pavement and put back a much thicker section and then resurface the whole street. Um, so th there are different techniques. It, it hasn't resulted, I wouldn't say, into a full rebuild for a whole street. Um, that's uh, fairly rare in that occasion. We're typically able to do it uh, implementing pavement repair, and that's, uh, that's a lot of what we do. Okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Rambar. Bill brings up an a interesting point. When we go out and mill a street, depending on the depth that we go, that obviously has some degree of, it affects the price per square yard. If you, I mean, I know, I think it was Third Street, we went extra because if we did and we put the pavement down, it had a longer life. Was that, in, how, does, in, in how this, do you do that? And when, when, on the contract like this, when we're milling streets, is it just standard or do we look at it on a case by case basis and go deeper and put more product down? In, in, this, in this contract, um, the, the milling cost is, is flat. It doesn't matter if we go an inch or two right. inches what matters more is how Put much asphalt we're down. putting back because that's where the real cost is and the cost of producing the asphalt and then placing the asphalt. With milling, it's just a matter of grinding it and putting it in a truck and hauling it away. So um, we, we make choices, and, and these are specific to the, to the street, to the subgrade, to the conditions that we're, that we're seeing out there what sort of payment section we're going to put back. Whether we're milling two, we might put back three, we might put back the exact same thing. It just all depends on what we find out there based on the cores. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Lastly, I just wanted to say um, this information uh, for the, the specific street locations is updated on our interactive street maintenance map, which is uh, accessible on the city's uh, uh, front page of the website. Yes, we have a question, Mr. Barnett. If, um, like, for example, I came down the street today coming here, and there's a big, like, pothole, like, really deep, and, you know, I guess the city has put the cones in those things. How, how, what happens there? Is that a part of this, or that's just your regular maintenance thing? That would be routine maintenance. Um, we get calls for potholes all the time. We have uh, staff members that every day they're going out and, and filling potholes. If it's if it's too big, it probably warrants some other sort of repair rather than traditional uh, pothole maintenance. We may have to cut it out uh, and do uh, pavement repair, as I described before. Uh, it just all depends on what we see. But if you have locations, just let us know, and we'll be happy to go look at them. Okay. So then the last question I would ask is, um, as, as we look at this project, what would you say to like citizens who may think, because when you said that the first part is to fix roads that are already pretty good, and then the second piece is to fix roads that are not as good as the first road, and then the last is to fix those roads that are really bad. Um, what if I sit back and think, oh, wait a minute, that road is getting fixed because it's on this side of town and not on that side of town? You know, how can we... I, I can, I'm more than happy to provide you with information that shows that we've done uh, milling and resurfacing in all six of our paving zones, which, which spreads across town. Um, the, the, uh, the techniques that I showed you are not limited to one certain area mm -hmm. of town. Okay. Um, and I would also say that those techniques are, it kind of reminds me of the old Fram oil filter commercial. You can pay me now or pay me later. And what we're trying to do is make, make sure that those streets that are in good shape don't end up costing us more at a later date by doing that. So we're, we're trying to be um, fiscally responsible with how we spend this money and, and uh, protect those roads that are in good condition. Okay. And all this is on the website so people can see where you're, what streets you're planning to do. And that, that whole piece is on there anyway about yes. what streets you're working on even right now. 
Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Spears. Yeah, Dave, this, this will fall right along with what uh, Councilman Barnett just said, but yesterday during the agenda briefing, you said we're almost approaching the season where we'll be limited in the, the work that we can do with these streets. And, and so my question was along those lines, how are we going to differentiate between where we start, when we start, what we can do in this small window of opportunity until next spring? Well, as soon as the contract gets executed, we will sit down with the contractor and, and develop a schedule. Um, it, it is likely that we would probably um, go with some milling and resurfacing to get some work done before the cold winter starts, uh, starts to hit, the cold temperatures start to hit. Um, a lot of the uh, uh, pavement preservation techniques it makes more sense to mobilize that sort of operation one time rather than bring them here for a short period of time, send them away for two or three months, and then bring them back in March, uh, typically when paving operations restart. Um, so that's, those are my initial thoughts on how it would work, but uh, until we sit down with a contractor at a pre-bid meeting, uh, or excuse me, a pre-construction meeting, um, I, can, I can certainly come back and provide more information about that uh, at that time. Yeah, just, just, I mean, I know we'll have a plan, <laughs> but, you know, when just hearing that yesterday, I was like, man, it seems like we should have a plan going into where we could initiate this in its season. You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're looking at it now, but like you said, and, and it is Wilmington, so, you know, it's going to get cold for a couple weeks, but uh, you know, just how, how we plan about going about handling this because these streets are an issue. And no matter where you are, and, and like Clifford said, if, if whatever part of town you're on, you could see, you do see some, some bad streets. So, you know, you would have some people saying, well, these streets over here suck, and I, won't, I was on this side of town and they're getting their streets done, and why aren't we getting our stuff done? So, thank you, Dave. Yes, sir. Okay, Dave. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to go ahead and take a voice, a voice vote on this because we do have some technical difficulty with some of our uh, equipment up here this evening. So um, do we have a motion to approve item C2? I offer a motion. We have a motion made by Councilman Barnett, second by Councilman Grady. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item passes unanimously. <coughs> Next section of business is our public information. No public information speakers signed up to speak this evening. So our first uh, item of business is our public hearings. And I will announce that the following public hearing uh, is an appeal from the Planning Commission's recommendations of denial. Item PH1 is an ordinance amending the official zoning map, the city, to rezone property containing 1.90 acres of land located at 33 80 and 3400 Mason Road Loop Road from O and I 1 CD Office and Institutional Conditional District to MFL CD Multifamily Low Density Conditional District to allow for a 16 unit townhome development. At this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Tony Caldwell. Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Uh, Brian Chambers, our senior planner, will overview this item for us. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Council. Uh, this site is located on the west side of Mesa Loop Road, just south of Andrews Reach, across the street from fire station number 15. Uh, it's approximately 1.9 acres in size and it's currently vacant. Uh, this is a map that shows you uh, the site within the context of the surrounding area. And then I have some photos from the subject property as well as adjacent properties. Uh, this is looking up and across Masonboro Loop Road. Uh, the bottom left will be the courtyard at Masonboro, um, which is the northeast. And then again, there's the fire station across the street. Um, we have a couple of photos of the subject property and then uh, single family homes to the south and north, and then the townhomes that are directly across the street behind the courtyard. 
In August of 2018, council rezoned the subject property from R15 to O1I conditional district for a commercial district mixed use project containing two office structures and five residential units. In September of 2020, council approved a modification to that conditional district to amend the building elevations and modify a zoning condition that prohibited amplified music. Uh, this is the current site plan that is approved for this site. Um, each office building was approved for 2,400 square feet of non-residential on the ground floor and two residential, residential units above each and then a fifth residential unit was approved above a detached garage in the back. Uh, the uses were limited to professional offices and personal services. Uh, this is the proposed site plan. The applicant proposes to rezone this property from ONI 1 to a multifamily low density conditional district for a 16 unit townhome development. Uh, following planning commission, the applicant did submit revised plans and elevations that included a reduced building height and enhanced, enhanced buffer yard planning to so the north and south. Those enhanced plannings are what's uh, kind of bubbled, bubbled in on the northern south uh, property boundaries of the plan you have on the screen. Uh, the site would be accessed by full access driveway on Mason Bur Loop Road. Uh, we'll note that Mason Bur Loop Road is currently operating above its design capacity and this rezoning would result in an increase in estimated vehicle trips. Uh, the applicant has included options to mitigate the impact of this proposed zoning um, and those, um, those options are outlined in attachment seven in the staff report. Uh, there is an approved trail project along Mason Bur Loop Road which includes curb and gutter along the west side of Mason Loop Road and extends a multi-use path from Andrews Reach to Navajo Trail. Uh, the proposed density and impervious of this uh, project requires the standards for exceptional design to be met. Uh, the applicant has accepted a uh, presented a narrative that does show compliance with these standards and that's included as attachment eight. A minimum 20 foot wide buffer will be required adjacent to the single family homes. And then uh, they are proposing to, to save all of the existing significant trees which includes two 38 inch oaks, a 32 and a 48 inch pecan, and a 60 inch oak. And those are shown on the screen. So this slide provides a comparison between the current and proposed plans. It outlines the building height, residential units, commercial square footage of each project, the parking space is provided and the impervious coverage. These are the proposed elevations that were provided by the applicant. As I previously mentioned, this was um, updated by the applicant after the appeal from Planning Commission to revise the, st um, the structures from two and a half stories to two stories. Uh, these proposed elevations are similar in design to those townhomes that I showed previously across the street behind the courtyard. The property is located across the street from an established neighborhood node as identified in our comp plan. The comprehensive plan calls for development with existing neighborhoods to be consistent with the design elements of nearby structures and enhance the overall character of the area. There are a number of non-residential uses, including a fire station, shopping center with restaurants, retails, and services located across the street. The proposed rezoning may serve as a compatible transition between this commercial area and the existing low density residential uses surrounding it. Staff believe this proposed zoning is generally consistent with our comprehensive plan and the city's adopted focus areas and staff believes the request is reasonable and the public interest is recommending approval. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have and I believe the staff, uh, the applicant is prepared to make a presentation as well. Are there any questions of Mr. Chambers? Okay, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chambers. This time I'd like to recognize the applicant. Thank you, good evening. My name is Cindy Wolf and I'm here on behalf of the owner and the potential developer of the property. This aerial view gives you the same idea that Brian discussed as far as the vicinity around the subject tract. The Create Wilmington plan identifies that area, as he said, as a neighborhood node, which is intended as small scale center of activity for surrounding neighborhoods. I know you've received several emails concerning the proposed project and many of them have voiced general opposition over the development of the parcel altogether and that happens. But keep in mind that the subject tract is already zoned for a commercial district mixed use and our request is a down zone 
to eliminate the business-oriented district and create a residential district, albeit for attached housing. This is the site plan that Brian showed, condition to the property today, and it can be developed with the offices, personal services, and five apartments. As a little bit of history, this was in 2018, and the current owner at that time purchased the property with the desire to use it as both her home and her office as a residential real estate agent. She added more space than just her needs, but it was certainly a modest plan for the overall acreage. We talked about future expansion to the rear, but at the time she decided she wanted to get what she needed, and so this plan was enough at the, that point in time. The subsequent hearing, I know you felt like you've heard this many times, but it was just the modification for the slight relocation of the garage and an update of the architecture. Both were very objective criteria. You know, they could have been handled administratively, but they came to this board. It has become obvious that this plan, well, we all know that development doesn't come cheap. It has gotten even more detailed and expensive since the time that she pursued this and there is almost a mandate for most development today to maximize the density and land use and to make a project successful. Ms. Drury quick, quick, I'm sorry, quickly realized that the costs of this development were going to be prohibitive for her. Then comes along COVID and the need for office rental space has changed altogether. It has become obvious that this plan is not feasible for her and it has not proved feasible for anyone else. This is the proposed plan for 16 single family, individually owned, attached townhomes. They're different in groupings to avoid monotony of the aesthetics. It is only 8.8 .8 units per acre, certainly not what be, would be considered high density in any way. The developer wants to provide an upscale housing style of 16 to 1800 square feet with a garage, selling in the 400,000 price range. All of the significant trees on the site have been worked into the layout and their preservation is a condition of approval. Permitting for construction around them will absolutely have the oversight of the TRC and the city arborist. The graphic sizing of the tree symbols that I've used on this exhibit are consistent with their actual canopies and for so much for allowing adequate separation from the new surfaces and the overall protection of them. There's abundant green space and common area around the site coordinated with those trees. The units have also been oriented such that the sides of the homes are what face the adjacent residential properties and not the front or back where you usually find your balconies or porches. The frontage structures along Masonboro Road continue to address the frontage and have entries and porches along them. I know there, are quest there were questions at the agenda briefing as to the consistency of what the Planning Commission reviewed and what we have in front of you, our appeal. With the exception of the enhanced buffer plantings at both the north and south boundaries on this, this is the exact site plan. So there isn't a lot of change to what they saw to what you saw. The primary change is on this plan is the buffer yards and then we'll discuss the height situation. The frontage structure, oh, I'm sorry. The prevalent topic of discussion at that meeting was the height of the buildings, which were proposed at that time at two and a half stories and up to 35 feet. We felt at that time that we had a valid justification for the proposal because just across the street, you have Jasper Place townhomes with a very similar design of that two and a half stories. This was our proposed elevation at the time of that hearing. Likewise, the adjacent residential community of Andrews Reach has homes that are single family and on larger lots, but the quality of their architectural design yielded raised foundations, high interior ceilings on dual floors and steep, steep roof pitches. Maximum height in the R15 district is 35 feet, which is technically measured at the mean of the highest roof pitch. I'm sure all of these houses are compliant with that criteria, but I don't doubt that some of the peaks are well in excess of the same 35 feet that we had proposed. The result of the hearing was that four of the commissioners voted to deny the petition, citing primarily density and height. However, three of them felt 
that the, adequacy, the adjacency of different housing styles is not a new concept and agreed with the staff recommendation for approval that this petition was consistent with the policies and strategies of the Create Wilmington vision. Regardless, we heard what was being said and in our appeal to you, we have reduced the floor areas, lowered the building heights to two story and enhanced the buffer yards. These are the proposed elevations now and the maximum height is conditioned to 26 feet. The Create Wilmington Comprehensive Land Use Plan includes a wealth of policies to direct future growth of the city and fully acknowledges the importance of infill development. Meanwhile, the housing shortage in our area has been well documented and interestingly enough, the 2021 housing needs assessment for our area shows the housing gap in for sale homes at the 296,000 um, range as the greatest deficit. This is the targeted market of this project. Impact on adjoining properties is always a point of discussion and points obviously vary. There is over 100 feet between the side of proposed Unit 7, I guess you can't see that, and the closest existing Andrews Reach home. The separation of Unit 6 is over 160 feet. You can see that the pads of those adjacent duplexes are smaller than the footprints of those single family homes. If this property were only developed for single family homes, I guarantee that there would still be homes in both of those locations and this conditional district approval will give those owners the assurance that these smaller buildings will be limited to 26 feet in height and buffered to boot. The separation along the southern boundary is less at roughly 55 feet, but keep in mind that the current plan, we're replacing a two-story garage with extended height for the RV with a residential unit above that would have had much more visibility towards that southern property. The same holds true there for the limited height and the buffering being guaranteed with this conditional district. Protection of the environment and stormwater management requirements are no different than those for the already approved plan. Soils testing has already been completed to, for infiltration at the rear of the tract and mitigation of any impervious surfaces beyond the 25 feet, I'm 25%, I'm sorry, will still be addressed by low impact design features for envir environmental sensitivity to the watershed resource. The same regulations and technical standards apply to all projects in our city, such that post-development runoff must be maintained to pre-development condition. These rules are in place for the protection of adjacent properties. I believe you've also heard opposition based on traffic, and any development near to a school, especially an elementary school, has to endure issues uh, with drop-off and pickup when parents opt out of the busing provided. The case summary shows that the difference between the existing plans, mixed uses, and those of the 16 townhome units are only two additional trips in the morning and five in the afternoon. The overall trips for the entire 24-hour day are estimated to be less than a tenth of a percent of the traffic capacity of Masonboro Loop Road, a minimal impact if at all. Our driveway certainly poses no impact to the Andrews Reach residents being downstream of their intersection. In closing, we believe that the staff summary more than adequately summarizes in their consistency section that there is an overwhelming consistency of the proposed project to the city's adopted plans, policies, and strategies for the future. I don't believe there is any discernible impacts to adjacent properties that have not now been addressed, and we believe that there are overall benefits to the community as a whole as what we look for when we're evaluating these conditional districts for their consistency to the land use plan. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions for the applicant? Yes, Mr. Barnett. Would you go back to the slide that had the one, I think it was 121% um, housing need? Yeah, that was. And now did I understand you to say that these houses will fall into this category? At what my developer has said, his price range is in the three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand. Yes, this is um, the two hundred and ninety-six plus as okay. home prices. Okay, because right, I know I heard four hundred thousand, and that's what kind of threw me off a little bit. But now I see the plus. I didn't see the plus at mm -hmm. first. Okay. 
Right. Mr. Anderson. Cindy, just to clarify, so it's, as I read, I believe the, the, the site itself is around 42% per pervious, and so the, the, the delta to 25 will be pervious payment. Is that right? Not, uh, there are a variety of things. The coverage is right now at 42%. Mm -hmm. That doesn't apply to any pervious surfaces yet. Um, when the engineer does their Con, uh, does their plan, their permitting, and their detailed design. There are a variety of things. Pervious concrete is absolutely one of them. Another is making sure that the areas between the driveways or the areas to the sides of the, the dumpster pad are possibly used as their own infiltration basins um, around the bushes. Uh, treating stormwater to a different level, uh, providing for a greater storm event and also porous surfaces and, uh, what I want to say, plants that are indigenous around us. Those are all the types of items that are in the charts in the code to provide that pulling together of what the impervious surfaces are and the 25% maximum. Who at the city or what is the mechanism that that kind of checks all those boxes? For you. The engineer provides a study similar to what I provided, but certainly much more detailed and site-specific um, for as they're designing. And those credits are applied by the engineering department during stormwater review. And they come up and come out and kind of inspect that kind of thing? Over. Well, it's part of the uh, certificate of occupancy yeah. to make sure that whatever design has been approved based upon those criteria are installed, yes. There'd have to be a certification ultimately by the engineer before certificate of occupancy. Okay. Thank you. Mr. O'Grady? Yes, sir. Cindy, how are you? Uh, uh, two things that the Planning Commission didn't see. One was the height, and I can see that from the pictures. The other is the buffering. And I see on your picture here, there's buffering there now. Tell me what density of this is, how opaque, how tall, because, you know, it could be a little hedge or it could be trees. What are we talking about there? That is somewhat subjective by the staff as we go. The normal 20-foot buffer yard is required to have three trees every 100 feet, which trees that will get at least 20 feet tall. In addition to that, there are three rows of evergreen shrubs, which are varied basically between, you know, up four to six feet. Uh, we're proposing that that be enhanced with a combination of other bushes and trees. Okay. Where is that in the proposal? Because We have not. It, it says on the site plan that Brian put up. Okay. So it's specified on the site plan? Because we don't, I don't know that we get that detail on our. You don't mind if I chime in here. The the sure. site plan that was submitted um, as an update after planning commission included the enhanced buffer yard that it had, um, I believe, Leland Cypress at 16 feet on center across that whole property line. So to add to the existing buffer or the buffer yard that's required by the code, adding Leland Cypress so that. Something like that, which is fast growing and gets up over 20 feet tall, will provide visual separation. And what else besides the cypress trees? What else? The usual buffer yard would be some type of shade tree and evergreen shrubs. And their separation depends on the type of shrub and how large they grow as far as their, uh, the width of them. But the Leyland cypress supplementing that will basically provide a continuous buffer at a higher height than is required now. And they grow fast. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Spears. Cindy, this is not really a question. It's more of a comment. If, but you can feel free to respond if you like. Um, we're citing the housing shortage, right? Mm-hmm. But we're talking about townhomes at the price point of three hundred and fifty thousand to four hundred thousand. So we're basically we're running out of places to live for rich people. Absolutely, that's what our housing 
if that housing study that the city contracted showed an overall deficit of housing for our entire city. And absolutely, there are um, not only, I mean, they're in all categories right there at the 74,000 to 123,000, there are a deficit of at least 862. Now, how they cry, created that criteria, uh, they're the experts, but there are deficits in all of the categories in our town for the people moving in. Keyword, people moving in. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. And so that was, was shared at the um, housing committee was that the idea of when you build houses that people can afford at, like, say, the $400 rate, that kind of opens the barrel for those who are, like, one less down to move up, mm -hmm. you know. So it really, in the, in the long run, it's helping everybody because, the, as you mentioned, the housing deficit is across the board. It really is across the board. So, um, okay. But I just wanted to share that. Anybody else? Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. At this time, um, I'm going to open up the public hearing. I will set the public hearing at 30 minutes, uh, which is our standard, and uh, allow each speaker allotment of three minutes to speak. If you need more, we will work on that. And so I will uh, ask for the first speaker to speak and state your name and where you live for the record. Mayor Zappo, City Council, thank you very much. My name is Brad Pod. I live in 5700 Andrews Reach Loop, which is one of the R15 lots that adjacent to the proposed applicant's uh, rezoning plan. Um, we would uh, like to thank you for listening to our concerns about this project and also like you guys to consider the decision made by your planning commission in this matter. They carefully considered um, the issues here and decided based on density, building height, lack of buffering and environmental impacts that this uh, rezoning should not go forward. Uh, I'd also like to bring to your attention the fact that the neighborhood node for this area is actually living across the street there. If this were developed as an OI-1 in a mixed use capacity, this would actually serve as a good transition from that neighborhood node to residential structures. The neighbors actually were uh, approving of the previous mixed use plan and we're looking forward to having that capacity, especially with the walking trail coming in and the, um, and the, the fact that there is commercial uh, land across the street. This as an R15, as a uh, multifamily low density, would not be part of that mixed use neighborhood node uh, capacity. Um, the down zone would actually increase the density of the building structures as well as increase the uh, impervious surfaces significantly. The neighbors are primarily concerned about issues with privacy as well as environmental impacts with the increased impervious surfaces. The local lay of the land, as you can see, starts at about 25 feet at the south end of the property and goes straight downhill to about 9 to 11 feet at the north end of their property. So everything run, runs downhill there. So despite whatever a planning, uh, you know, to get through a technical review, commission one may actually um, uh, be approved, we're really concerned about stormwater runoff down, uh, downhill down towards where the marsh lives. Um, we're also concerned about the historic trees that are on the property there too. You can see that some of the building structure lives underneath the 60 inch oak tree canopy and there's a retention pond that's in very close proximity to the root structure there. So our concern is that there will be an impact to these historic trees that serve an environmental purpose as well with migratory bird populations around there. The traffic speaks for itself. Mason Borough Loop uh, has an F rating in terms of traffic density now. The uh, argument from Ms. Wolf is that, well, it's just a little bit more, but every little bit of traffic along that uh, thoroughfare uh, is uh, an important part of what goes on there. And uh, in consideration that there's this East and Mason 
um, development that's going on literally almost across the street there, a couple hundred feet to the south, that has 178 units. So that will be a significant impact. The traffic uh, study that was cited did not take into account the new development that's going to be uh, you know, 800 feet to the south that has about 200 units. Um, so what we would conclude is, or ask uh, the city council is to uh, reject this appeal to send it back to planning commission we would hope that uh, the developer would uh, stick with the mixed use plan. The you know, land use plan for 2022 is about smart density. This is dense, but it's not very smart. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right. I'm, I'm Glenn George. I have the track of land that's right beside it, the largest piece. Um, just with the Planning Commission, I had, I talked to them about privacy as far as my whole track of land is basically being over, I mean, just every aspect of my whole life, I feel like, that I've put in for 25 years is just going to be overshadowed by all these units, the whole piece of property that I have. And I just would like to Ask everyone, would so you? Can I ask you? Yes, sir. Which piece of property is the, yours? The biggest piece of track, 34A on, let's see, I think it's on the, not the neighborhood side, but this other side, the largest yeah, piece of track. Down below. Yes, sir, down below. It's 3408. Yes, yeah, south of it. Yes, that's correct. And I'm just, I don't know, I just don't know how to, I don't know. It just seems like it's just going to be overshadowed by every aspect of my whole property with all of this, uh, the buildings and everything. Like I say, the density part. And if you go out and look at it, it just, that's a lot of units for that little area that's at, you know, I mean, I just want, I wish people could come out and actually look at, physically see the piece of property and see how small that is with how much is going to be put on it. So anyway, thank you very much. Good evening. Um, my name is Sarah Williamson, and I'm just going to read, if that's okay, from my phone. Thank you again for letting us speak and hear our concerns. I reside at 5413 Andrews Reach, which is one of the four properties um, aligning the empty lots. And I apologize, more of us couldn't be here, but six out of the eight of the adjacent, adjacent homeowners are healthcare providers that have had a pretty tough year and a half. It was a little challenging to break our night schedules, but here we are, and this is important to us. I am speaking out tonight strongly opposing the proposal of the multifamily, low-density, residential townhome development that will sit directly in my backyard. As I said last month, we understood when we purchased our home five years ago, the land behind our house was going to be developed. The difference in single-family homes or the current mixed-use plan in 16 townhomes is far from a similar development, as it was suggested by one of the commissioners at the closing of last month's meeting. Before supporting this overdevelopment, I urge you to try to take a left out of our neighborhood. This is nearly impossible. Two things to add to this. One, Beasley Road has the identical problem with near-miss accidents every day. The new development, as Brad stated, um, East and Mason, directly across from Bradley Road, uh, Bradley, Bradley Road will, will add 170 new families to this problem very soon. These traffic problem areas um, lie only a couple hundred feet at most from this proposed development. And two, because of the incline the, the lots sit on, there is a blind spot from anywhere you try to pull out from, and that incoming traffic is going 45 miles an hour. As stated before, I cannot emphasize enough the hazardous grade F conditions Masonboro Loop Road currently possesses. As I mentioned before, the Cross City Trail in the design phase has been promised to neighbors in our community for years. For some, their children were in kindergarten and are now in high school. The Cross City Trail cannot realistically be a factor in decreasing any vehicular concerns. Another issue I would like to call to your attention is light pollution. Obviously, the more units built, the more light negative, negatively emits. I also welcome you to stand in my backyard to have a better understanding of the view. This again, in my opinion, will contribute to more overdevelopment issues and certainly different than the original plan for multi-use or the prior plan for single-family homes. In closing, 
Even with the increase in buffer and the decrease in height, ultimately the footprint of the new proposal has not changed, and that is our biggest concern. There is still a drastic increase in impervious surfaces, a major increase in traffic flow, and most certainly multiple negative environmental impacts. So on behalf of Andrews Reach Neighborhood, please again reject the overdevelopment of this piece of land and consider keeping the development residential or the current mixed use plan. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Darshan Dave. I live in the uh, 5704 Andrews Reach Loop, that's second on the left as you pull in. Um, so uh, again, supporting my neighbors here and to re reiterate some of their points. Uh, number one, I think it is important to take into consideration the you know, original decision by the uh, Planning Commission, because clearly there weren't uh, compelling enough reasons to, to change uh, you know, the original plans that, as Brad had mentioned, we may have been hesitant to support initially with the mixed use, but eventually we sort of grew to, to look forward to, as Sarah had mentioned. Uh, I think there is an argument to be made that the, the lot itself that we're talking about isn't directly part of our neighborhood node. Again, as Brad had mentioned, the commercial uh, properties are across the street, uh, which we support often by walking across a very busy intersection, which is only gonna be worsened as from some of the arguments you've just heard. Um, Again, traffic, morning, drop-off, pickups for our kids down the street at the school, uh, those, those are big challenges here. Um, I, I would make the argument that uh, this is, you know, considered, I would think, you know, higher density when we're talking about 16 units versus the original five uh, units from the uh, original plan. Um, the other things to consider, uh, which uh, were, were discussed earlier, include uh, setbacks from the property, privacy being serious concerns. Uh, if you think about as Brad had mentioned, the elevation of the property, somewhere around 10 feet higher, add 25 to that, you're talking about 35 plus feet in height. Uh, you know, we have small children, uh, safety is always an issue, uh, a big concern of ours. Um, additionally, as we had mentioned, environmental impact, downhill from the property, draining, flooding, uh, other issues with a retention pod, uh, re excuse me, retention pond, uh, an already very challenging mosquito, uh, population, that would probably worsen as well. Um, that's another uh, consideration. Uh, another thing to, to point out, there was an earlier uh, meeting several months ago with the uh, developer, uh, uh, the out-of-town developer, I should say. They were not really aware of the surrounding area. Uh, they didn't really know there was a fire station nearby, uh, uh, elementary school down the street, uh, so, so I didn't really get a good vibe from that. Um, so in closing, again, I ask that you, that you all uh, respectfully uh, consider the, the recent decision uh, that was made, uh, considering the now, I think it is maybe the fourth iteration of this development proposal uh, for, for the property. Yes, I understand development is uh, likely and probably necessary uh, in that area, but we have to ask ourselves, you know, what makes the most sense and what environmental cost would be incurred when we're considering higher uh, density uh, housing. I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Madam Clerk, have you uh, received any additional comments? Sorry. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did receive um, some comments. The first one was for, from Sonia Nevejar, 5709 Andrew Reach Loop. I would like to oppose the request to build 16 two-story townhomes in this small section of Masonboro Loop Road. This area is already extremely congested with traffic due to the fact it is a two-lane road right next to the neighborhood and elementary school. Traffic is often already backed up to this area during school drop-off and pickup. There is a fire station directly across the street, and I'm sure they would agree that the last thing we need is more congested two-lane roads. 
This proposed project also appears to take away a lot of the green spaces that were in the original plans and replace them with more buildings. This will likely create increased drainage issues to our neighborhood that is right next to this space. I strongly urge you to consider these points before approving such a huge density proposal. Thank you. The next one is from James Williams, 5509 Andrew Reach Road. I'm writing in opposition to the request to rezone 3380 and 3400 Mason Brulute Road from ONI CD to MFCD. I'm a resident of the Andrew Reach neighborhood adjacent to this track. I would urge you to consider the argument that this is some way is a natural progression from the commercial nod at the intersection of Masonboro Loop and Masonboro Sound Roads. If you take a moment to examine the GIS map of the area, you will see that the lands on the western side of Masonboro Loop Road in the vicinity of the proposed project are zone R15. But for a church and Masonboro Elementary School, this is the case until you reach the Navajo Trail intersection to the south. The subject track is perfectly suitable for an R15 development. It is not the proper location for a high density MF development. The track is surrounded by R15 development. To argue that it is some natural progression from the commercial nod across the street is a red herring simply meant to make it easier for you to accede to the developer's request. There is no sound basis on which to approve this request and to place high density directly in the middle of an area exclusively zone R15. We and Andrew Reach were comfortable with the earlier proposal of Ms. Virginia to rezone this track to ONI CD. She had proposed a much less dense use with significantly greater setbacks along our common boundaries. There were significant conditions placed on the uses that made her plan workable despite the fact that the adjoining tracks were all R15. Lastly, I would like to add to the cries for real effort to remedy traffic in the city. Masonboro Loop is functioning at an F rating already. Two projects currently under development which will add thousands of trips per day have not even opened yet. Please don't add to it with another high density development. Thank you for your careful consideration. Ashan. Uh, 5412 Andrew Reach Loop. I am writing a strong opposition to the proposed two-story 16-unit condominium complex on Masonboro Loop Road next to Andrew Reach Development and opposed to the and opposite of the fire station. My concerns are magnifold, including the impacts on traffic, hardscaping and land and resulting impacts of stormwater management, water retention and insect problems. With schools on Mason Burlett Road and existing residential and commercial developments, the traffic on these two lane roads is already horrible and more construction is already permitted. The traffic impact is downright scary. Kids from Andrew Reach and other neighborhoods walk to Parsley Elementary and traffic is already horrible with schools. The school systems are already beyond breaking points and this neighborhood only adds to the problem. While I am open to a low density development on the road like single family homes, I am strongly opposed to this development for the above mentioned reasons. Thank you. Um, Brian, um, question. You, um, you'd made a comment about this was a down zone. I thought someone made that comment. Maybe, um, Cindy, could you come up and kind of explain that? We're hearing high density. You're talking about down zoning. Which one is it? Generally speaking, commercial development, commercial zoning districts are considered more of an up zone than residential developments. Residential, there's obviously all of the R districts, and then there's the multifamily districts. But in a hierarchy, it generally goes the residential, the multifamily, the commercial, the industrial. And so it is currently an office and institutional. And yeah, I mean, he was right. The original proposal to jump over Mason Burr Loop Road with the commercial district was questioned extensively at that time. When you look at our zoning map, it sort of sits over there, uh, you know, and it's not as part of the node that got created at Mason Burr Commons. But I think its modest nature won the day back then. Realistically, business on that side of the road, it's limited to offices and personal services. If it's personal services, yes, some of those people could walk to them. But I mean, I have to say that when Ms. Drury came to me in the first place, it was, it was a leap, but it was something she wanted for herself. That makes a difference sometimes. You're willing to do less than would generally be done. You're also willing, not as savvy to the development and, and the market. 
And that's, I think, what happened back then. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Anderson. Ms. Wolf, the, did um, it come up at any point during the conversations with the neighbors about fencing, or does it already exist, or is it, is they it already have requested fenced. by anyone? Mm -hmm. uh, typically in these things, we, we tend to see that, so I just would. Both the north and south boundaries already have their own fences, and we've made it policy. I mean, staff has pretty much dictated now that using the reduced 10-foot fenced buffer yards when there are already existing fences is not reasonable because then that no man's land between the the existing fe or the fence that's the neighbors and your fence gets to be not maintained it has problems with critters and all kinds of things so a fenced option was not available to us we have to put in the in, the full 20-foot buffer yard okay. requirement our um these all, I guess, basically the same? Are they two-bedroom, three-bedroom, or are they going to vary? Or we... I'd venture to say the five in the center would probably be end up being two-bedroom. They're just two foot more narrow than all the rest of the units. But two to three bedrooms, it just depends on how the architect lays out the floor plan. A lot of times in a type of product like this, the townhomes, they're two bedrooms and they use that other bedroom for an, an off, a home office, a guest room. Generally, the two bedrooms are satisfactory. Okay, Mr. Barnett? Sure. And I don't know if this is to you or to the staff, but um, I've been hearing over and over about like the stormwater and the drainage because it's like on the hill. Um, could you address that for us? Certainly. The, the property drains back to that upper left-hand corner today. Um, obviously, as it drains today, it's in a natural state. The buildings that had been there have been removed. And so other than the building pads that were there, um, the water still drains down to that corner of the site. After development occurs, not only is it in the watershed, and so we have to address a reduction by low density impact or low impact design features to get down to that qualification of 25% impervious credits. But there is the pre and post development criteria of the law of the, the city's stormwater code. So however that water acts today, it cannot act any differently when this development is completed. And that means that it has to be detained so that it doesn't leave the site anymore during that 25-year storm. And that's what you have to do? That's correct. Long. All the permitting, before they can put a shovel in the ground, that stormwater permitting through both the city and they handle the state's water quality control, and that's the environmental aspect of it all. Not only is it detaining water so that there's not flooding and off-site drainage, any different than the pre-post condition, we are also having to treat the water by infiltration in this particular case, which is sort of defined as a dry pond. The water infiltrates out. Any oils or chemicals from fertilizer seep into the ground and, and are controlled for water quality before it percolates out into our creeks. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, Mr. Rambar. This is for staff. I want to ask Brian. The the, the calculations for stormwater runoff are, are mathematical. I mean, we're not out there gauging runoff now. That's re correct. In real time, and we won't be out there gauging it. The neighbors will. So, if the, when the math is done and you determine the size of the retention pond, all your uh, slopes so that everything goes there. In the event, and I'm not saying in this one, but I know that it has happened, there is more post-construction runoff than what was anticipated. If that were to happen, what, what is the recourse that we as a city have as, as uh, issuing the okay and or the county issuing building permits? Is there any recourse in the event that something like that happened? And I know during construction, we just had an issue 
while construction's going on, we over off of uh, George Anderson, and we had a 50-year storm, a lot of rainfall, and, and the neighbors were complaining, and I said, well, it's, it's not finished yet. So they're going to be watching to make sure that after it is finished, that that runoff is not more than what it was when there were woods there. You, am I making myself any kind of clear as to what I'm asking? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I don't know that they're designing the system to capture the water, and I, I guess you're asking if that system fails in the future, what would happen? If they're compliant with the permit, um, I don't know. I honestly don't know what the recourse is on the city side um, because I'm not stormwater. I'm not writing the permit. I don't know how it's enforced on that end. Um, the only thing I am aware of, if there is flooding from this site to an adjacent property, there would definitely be a civil issue between private property owners that they're actually causing some harm. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar enough with the stormwater permitting to give you a good answer as to what the city's ability to go in and enforce. I mean, if they're compliant with the permit, they're compliant with the permit. If it goes beyond that, I really don't have a good answer for it. I apologize. I really don't. I mean, I don't see flooding as an issue with this particular property. I mean, it's got the elevation. It's not. I mean, if everything, if all the, if all the math is done correct, it, it naturally will flow to that back right corner. It was just a question that, that's been on my mind, and I don't know why I never ask it. But, uh, you know, I mean, th th we're not infallible. I mean, things can happen like that. I mean, not purposely, but if it did, what recourse would the city and or the county and or the state have to make it get corrected? Yeah, that was all. Right. You, you answered and, and after question. tonight, I will have an answer to that question. Pardon me? I said that after tonight, I will, I'll make sure I have an answer okay. to that question. I apologize. I wasn't trying to get you. I was just. No, I, I deserve to get God. I'll get the answer. Okay. Thank you. Well, and if I may, Mr. Bravenbark, there are checks and balances. First of all, a, a certified engineer creates the, the calculations, the plan. The city reviews it. Again, certified engineers and a permit is um, submitted. Before occupancy, the surveyor on our side has to have it surveyed, document that it matches that design that they did. Again, the city reviews that as built and verifies that everything matches. And so there are checks and balances along the way. And, and if it were to fail, I think, excuse me, part of it, part of that permitting is also a maintenance plan. And that's probably where situations that you're referring to could potentially happen. And there is recourse because if that permit is in violation because it hasn't been maintained, um, the, uh, every so many years, any type of sediment that accumulates in the bottom, which depletes the volume of it, has to be removed. If you get too many water lilies, if you, so there are checks and balances. I know that over the uh, as as the retention and detention ponds evolved from from their beginnings back in the 90s or whatever, that in the beginning people would build a detention pond and forget Just it. Leave it go. And then the detention pond service business became the rage. So they do have to be maintained. You can't just dig a hole and expect it to work forever. So. It is a perpetual permit that is overseen by both the state and the city, and it becomes after the developer responsibility of the owners association and so there's always someone responsible thank you ma'am Ms. Haynes um miss wolf it, it seems to me from from reading the information that the major things from planning were the runoff preserving the trees and the height and we we under basically understand how the water is dealt with and the permitting and all of that. We don't know the details, but we grasp the basics. Um, so it seems to me that you all have sort of tried to deal with that and reducing the height and are all of the trees that were mentioned protected? Absolutely. Um, that is one of the conditions that the staff has on this order. Uh, we paid attention as we laid this out in the first place to the tree canopies, which are generally considered consistent with the root structure. But regardless, you know, more roots fly out, but there are methods of mitigating those impacts when construction is nearby right. and then protecting it after the buildings are there. Um, my one concern, and maybe you've dealt with this, but the gentleman to the south that has the long piece mm -hmm. of, of property, um, 
he, he clearly is concerned about what, you know, he, he's going to back up to the whole thing. Um, is there any discussion with him about a more, a, a larger, like the Leland Cypress? The same Cypress thing. Or the same thing is being applied to the southern boundary to, to the as southern the northern boundary. boundary. So it would also have the higher evergreen screen of the Leyland Cypress along with the regular six foot high evergreen buffer with intermediate interest. Okay. I'm not sure he's aware of that. That's the first he's heard of that, but you could reassure him that that is... Absolutely. That's what is on the screen ahead of you as far as the clouds on the north end and the south end. And those clouds basically say that the buffer yard will be enhanced with the Leyland cypresses, which reach a higher height than the 20 feet and more solid and evergreen um, as part of this condition. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Anderson. So if you can answer, or, or Brian, you probably know this question as well, but in an R15, what is the size? Is there a side yard setback? Side yard setbacks in an R15 are 10 feet. In the multifamily, they're 20 feet. Okay, so we're getting more side yard. Than there would be with R15, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Barnett. I saw a person in the audience raise their hand. Are they allowed to speak now? Or okay, I saw that young guy. Thanks. Just wanted to enter into the record that the back uh, sides of the Andrews Reach neighbors, which is the north side of the property, does flood currently with the runoff. And that's at, you know, with a one single pad that was probably less than, you know, 3% impervious surface. And now we're going to 25%. So I think that the city council is correct in questioning what happens when the retention pond doesn't do its job or the grade, you know, doesn't accept all the water back to that back corner. Right now it doesn't. It's all along the entire fence area there that it floods. Thank you. Cindy, uh, to, to the gentleman's point, there are no stormwater management facilities there now. I understand that. Okay. I'm not disagreeing with that. Obviously, it's a vacant track of land. Uh, to his point, though, with I guess he's making a comment that this particular piece of property floods their property. Is that correct, sir? That this piece of property is being flooded in your property. Okay. Okay. So the, the question is, I guess, uh, and maybe Brian, you can, you can, you Anderson can answer this. The calculation is for what year type of storm? The 25 year storm. 25. And what's that calculation at? How many, Excuse inch, me? how many inches or bring? I or think it's an inch and a half. Inch and a half? Uh, well, <laughs> It's all based on calculations. It's based on 7.2 inches per hour, and that's one of the factors of the calculation. The inch and a half is the storage that they have to take. I, I mean, I'm not an engineer, but... Nor am I. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Rumber. I've been, I've, one of, I've, although I will say that one of the criteria for the credits for the reduction or, or mitigating the percent of impervious over the 25% is designing to not only the 25, but the 50 year or the 100 year storm. And so that is one of the things open to the engineering toolbox, if you will, whenever they do design this, they have to account for the existing conditions and what is happening now. So I guess my, my, it's mostly a comment that the properties in Andrews Reach have always flooded during a, a rain event or during a, during a significant rain event. And I, I guess it is a question that I have now. Will the plan for stormwater retention, on, if this project were built out, will it stop that? I think it's a fair question. Yeah, 
I mean, well, you got a detention right, bond. Right and, now, the site just sweeps across the entire property boundary. What will have to happen is the runoff from all of the surfaces, some of them will end up being porous, so that won't have runoff, but the rooftops for sure and any pavement that is not unporous will be directed to the pond. Right now, you've just got sheet flow across the entire site. There is somewhat of a ditch along that property line. Yeah. I don't know whether it's maintained and it, it's not maintained on our side because there's no development and there's nobody taking responsibility, obviously, at this juncture until it's developed. But I believe that part of that ditch is on their property. So I have no idea whether it is well maintained in their backyards. So all of those things get accounted for, get uh, the microscope applied to them when the engineer and the city are reviewing the stormwater permitting. Well, well nobody in the room is an engineer, and I okay. certainly am in that crowd. Yeah. But the, the detention pond is put where it's put for a reason. And when the engineers do their slopes and their gradings, they, they do it with that in mind. Yes. So it, it stands to reason to me uh, here before anything's ever done out there that, that the water would be at least encouraged to go that way versus oh, it has it has to be but what ha what happens right now is it sweeps across the entire north line what will happen because for example unit 7 and 8 will be raised a bit and whether it be a retaining wall then all that water has to go to the pond so yes there will be water redirected to where it will be attenuated thank you ma'am mr Ad mr spears go ahead don't we have Stonewater in here? Don't we have somebody from Stonewater in here? Can we get some? Can we get some input from them? Well, we we have an engineer that I guess is working with Mrs. With, with your with your. Well, there will be an engineer working with my client when yeah. they go into detailed design yeah. and permitting. Yeah, but there's not an engineer in here. Currently. But there's, it has been preliminary. When she had her project, it got submitted for the technical review committee. They did soils testing to verify that this can be a dry pond. It doesn't have to be a wet pond, which is an advantage to the environmental quality and also the capacity of it. It had very good soil infiltration capabilities and it had a low seasonal groundwater. Mm -hmm. What hasn't been done is picking up all the water to direct it to there, and that's part of the detailed engineering. But yes, I mean, an engineer has looked at the feasibility. I don't just come up with these plans on my own without background as based upon not only the surface area. I mean, there's some tricks that I've used over the years and it coincides with the plans that the engineers then take upon approval and take further through the process. So yes, it hasn't just been, I put it there or I placed that size of it. It has been thought out. Okay. The answer to account, Councilman Spears' question is, we do not have a member of the, the stormwater engineer uh, here tonight because, generally speaking, we have the project planner who is the, the team representative. We generally don't bring the team members in on, on projects like this. We do have Dave Mays, who uh, used to be our stormwater engineer um, at present, but I don't know that he can answer questions about calculations with regard to this without additional information. Dave, Dave, can you give us your general expertise on this? Can I make, I make a comment here? There's been some changes made since the Planning Commission meeting. We've heard from a lot of the residents here that are concerned about the stormwater calculations, and I need to have a little bit more, a lot more information about that because I have some concerns about that, and I think we all are asking these specific concerns, and to bring Dave Mays up on a project this cold to tell me that, I think would be, that, that wouldn't be fair to him nor you. I would like, I, I, and because the Planning Commission did not hear the changes that had been made and some of the concerns that we've heard tonight, I would like to remand this back to the Planning Commission for further review, because I think it's the right thing to do to get them to get more eyeballs on it and give us a, a, a different calculation based on some of the stuff. I understand where you're coming from, Cindy, and I think you've met a lot of the criteria based on what the planning staff has recommended, but I have some concerns in respect to this. And also this gentleman over here that wasn't even aware of the fact that there was a buffering situation for him, and I think that the buffering needs to be much more well-defined 
to let folks know. I understand there's people who do not want this project, period. I get that. But there are some serious concerns that have been raised here that I'd like to have it remanded and let them have, take a look at it. All right. Okay. I, I would, Mr. Mayor, I would second that. I was just going to say that. I, I don't feel comfortable voting on this without planning, having looked. I mean, they had a problem with the height and with the buffering. We've been told that's fixed, but I don't know if it satisfies them. Uh, they're a little more technical, although not completely technical. So any of these other questions about the runoff, I think they're better equipped to advise us on those, which is yeah. their job, and I think it definitely should be remanded. And especially if these people's backyards are being flooded and the sheet flow is going over there. I understand you've got it cap captured and it's a 25-year storm, but I know with the calculations, seven and a half inches per hour, it gives us some understanding, but we need a lot more technical write-off on it. Okay. All right. All right. So, Mr. Grady, are you making the, the thing to, to remand it back? Yes. Yes. I'll make okay. that motion. All right. We have a motion to remand this back to our planning commission. My council member Grady, second my council member Barnett. Any further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I do apologize, but uh, this question is for council member O'Grady in regards to his motion. Uh, am I correct in stating that the remand is back to planning commission? For them to take into consideration the buffering and stormwater specifically and then any other factors that they find that there's been a change of circumstance the height the buffering and the stormwater because their problems were with height and buffering so thank I you like i, I think planning list. commission will benefit from that guidance and, and, and we will keep the public hearing open so the public hearing i have not closed it okay very good all in favor of that motion please indicate by saying aye aye, aye. Any opposed? That item passes unanimously. That brings us to our next item of business, which is item PH2, which is an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city to rezone property containing 6.06 .06 acres of land located at 821 and 827 South College Road and 4881 and 4885 Wilshire Boulevard from RB Regional Business and RBCD Con Regional Business Conditional District to UMX CD urban mixed-use conditional district for a mixed-use development. This time I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Tony Cottle. Mr. Cottle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Associate Planner Jeff Walton will overview this item for us. Good evening. According to tax records, a automobile dealership has operated at the site since the late 1960s. In 2020, the last tenant, Hendrick Honda, and formerly Stevenson Honda, moved to 6720 Market Street. The subject site remains vacant. The applicant proposes to rezone the site from regional business and regional business conditional district to UMX conditional district for mixed-use development of 298 units, 15,000 square feet of retail, 364 space parking deck, and 94 surface parking spaces. This is a general area where the site is located, uh, all across the street from Harris Theater on South College, just south of the former Kmart, and within walking distance of UNCW. This is photos of the subject site of the uh, former car dealership, some adjacent properties across the street uh, on Wilshire as well as South College of some of the adjacent properties. On August 16, 2005, City Council rezoned the rear property, 4881 and 4885 Wilshire, from R10 residential to RBCD for a 5,200 square foot automotive detail building. Tonight the proposal includes extending Wilshire Boulevard 150 feet to the southeast, adding pavement, curb, gutter, sidewalks along the frontage of the subject site. A 20-foot buff yard along the rear property line adjacent to the University Place apartments will remain, uh, including all existing vegetation. There are two vehicular connections proposed to the north uh, to the former Kmart site. Based on the intensity of the proposed use, a traffic impact analysis was required. Uh, the approved recommendations state that no improvements are recommended for South College nor Wilshire Boulevard. This is a general elevation of the proposed development. 
The comprehensive plan supports development that is consistent with the context of the surrounding area. The plan supports higher residential densities along transit routes, limited surface parking lots, and quality building designs. The proposal would allow the construction of a mixed use project that will provide housing and some commercial services along the east side of College Road, the same side as UNCW. These commercial and residential uses will wrap structured parking and minimize surface parking. The proposal includes future access to Kmart to the north, thereby, thereby enhancing redevelopment opportunities on site. One of the shortcomings of the project is the lack of safe pedestrian crossing of College Road directly to the full service Harris Teeter uh, and shopping center across the busy arterial. Residents of the, of the development will be tempted to cross College Road without the protection of a crosswalk. Otherwise, the only available alternative is to travel by vehicle to the shopping center. Staff notes that the site is an ideal location for the applica application of the recently adopted commercial district mixed use standards. A CDMU project would be permitted by right within the existing regional business district, thereby requiring no rezoning of the property. In addition, the inclusion of some workforce housing in the development would allow for unlimited residential density. While the proposed application of the UMX zoning is not generally favored at, a, at this suburban location, the project does exhibit many attributes called for in the Great Wilmington Comprehensive Plan. On balance, therefore, staff believes the request is reasonable and in the public interest, and we recommend conditional approval with the conditions outlined in the case summary. And I believe the applicant is also here to make a presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions uh, for staff? Yes, Mr. O'Grady. I completely agree with you about the shortcoming. I, I like this project. It's in the right place, walking distance to campus, keeps kids off the roads, lots of great things. But we've got to get them across this college road. I mean, there's got to be some provision for that. Uh, we can't create a situation where we're going to have kids running across, which is what's going to happen. Um, so I, I really think the, this needs to go back to the uh, pr proposer and see if they can come up with some plans for crossing. It, it was discussed. Um, the Walk Wilmington plan, I believe, is in your case summary, uh, did identify this as being ideal for the, in, in the improvement of crosswalks at this location. Uh, it was presented to the applicant. Um, as you can, can uh, re remember that any uh, recommendation we have in our staff report, the applicant has to agree to it. Um, that has been presented and it wasn't really accepted by the applicant. Maybe the applicant can address it further uh, during their presentation, but yeah, it has been proposed. To me, that is the major drawback of this proposal, is there's we no agree. way to get across College Road. And we already have that problem. We don't need to make it worse. Sure. I think Charlie would agree with that. <laughs> I think you would agree we don't need to make crossing College Road even worse. <laughs> now, I know that there's there are plans either on the board being talked about uh, coming up the Wilshire or coming down Carr and then crossing over college um, in some of the discussions I've had with the university and, and DOT. So I don't know how that will affect this, but I do know there's, I mean, you just mentioned Walk Wilmington uh, coming up Wilshire Boulevard to cross College Road. Are you more familiar with that than I obviously am not? In that intersection? Yes. yes. I, used to, I used to live out there. So, um, The uh, Walk Wilmington plan is identified as attachment five in your documents. I don't have it on the presentation, but there in the, the map does identify that intersection as adding pedestrian, pedestrian signal connections across South College Road. Right there at Wilshire. Yes, Wilshire and South College. Yes, sir. Do we know where it is in the pipeline? I mean, is that something that could coincide? I know I'm asking you a question that you probably hadn't <laughs> boned up on, but. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where that is in the pipeline. The only thing I can say is referring to the map, it says that it's a short-term solution. I'm not sure where that is in a budget cycle, but I think it is on the radar to, to improve that intersection. I just don't know the time frame for it. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Anderson. Um, we don't have our MPO director here, do we? Is Mike here today, tonight? No. Because I know also there's, I don't know the details by any means, but there's plans for that whole, to, li to, to limit the number, to what's the word? Seal, seal a lot of these driveways and more islands and, and have a less left right turns more turnarounds it, it was it was on deck as we know and we've we've discussed at length the, the funding at the dot level but that was a that's a project to make that whole area uh less congested and i don't know mike could tell us but you know i'm sure it's six eight ten years away but i think so the i can get to the aerial um, the aerial itself shows um, three driveways on Wilshire as well as a larger driveway on, on College Road. Um, you know, I don't have an easy answer for you on driveways. You know, they are trying to... On driveways, I'm saying part of that whole big project is m more pedestrian. When yeah. There's less people turning. I'm not talking about this particular driveway. I'm talking about the whole, the whole length of College Road. Sure. From, from uh, Oleander to uh, Market. So, but without Mike here, I'm just blabbering. So <laughs> we'll wait on him. Yes, sir. Mr. Gray, did you, did you, did you, did you, you already spoke? I'm sorry. I'm, okay. I've covered this before. Okay. Everybody, everybody speak? Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. At this time, I'd like to recognize the applicant. Good evening, Mayor Sappho and members of council. I'm Andy Van Trite. I'm an attorney here in Wilmington with the law firm of Merckx and Taylor and Gibson. I'm here tonight on behalf of the developers, Bella Vista Development Group, LLC, and Craig Davis Properties, Inc., as well as the current property owner, Susan Booth Stevenson. Also here with me tonight are several members of our development team, including Marianna Molina and Craig Davis for the developers, Laura Miller and Danny Adams of the architecture firm LS3P, E.J. Gwynn and Tammy Spivey of CEPI Engineering, and Don Bennett, a senior transportation engineer with Javenport. You'll hear from Danny Adams in a moment on the design and certain technical aspects of this project, but I want to first take a few minutes to briefly summarize the proposed project and the primary reasons we believe that this conditional district rezoning request should be approved. As Jeff Walton has already so capably described for you, my clients, the developers, are seeking to rezone a little over six acres of land on the corner of South College Road and Wilshire Boulevard from the Regional Business District and the Regional Business Conditional District to the Urban Mixed Use Conditional District in order to construct a mixed use development to be known as Paseo, which will contain Class A residential rental units and amenities, ground level retail, food and beverage and other service sector commercial uses, and a combination of structured and surface parking. All is more specifically set out in the site plan submitted with our application, and as Danny Adams will further discuss momentarily. For a number of reasons, this site is ideally situated for redevelopment in just this manner. It was formerly operated as a, as a car dealership, but has been vacant for over a year now. It's located next to the large former Kmart site, which has likewise been vacant for quite some time, and the former Dick's Sporting Goods across South College Road from our site is now vacant as well. This project will lead the way toward re revitalizing this transitioning area, which sits in the middle of town on a major thoroughfare and a primary retail corridor within one mile of the ever-growing UNCW campus. Our request is also directly in line with the city's plans for this area, as set out in the Create Wilmington Comprehensive Plan, which places the site within an area of opportunity for a higher density urban mixed use center like Paseo. This project will implement the city's strategies for such urban mixed use centers by, among other things, including a rich mix of uses, placing buildings directly onto public streets, providing active ground floor uses, and incorporating structured parking to accommodate higher densities. In addition, Paseo will provide much needed additional housing options for the increasing Wilmington population, likely including but certainly not limited to UNCW faculty, staff, and fellows. It's worth mentioning also that the rear portion of the site is currently within the regional business conditional district, meaning that actually it, it must be rezoned before it can be used as anything other than a 5,200 square foot automobile detail building. So it does have to be rezoned to be used for any other purpose. 
Also, it's worth mentioning again that this is not student housing. I just want that to be clear. It's, it's not intended to be that way, and it's not expected to exclusively serve students at all. I'll hand it over to Danny Adams now, but we'll go ahead and respectfully request that you concur with the recommendations of staff in the Planning Commission and approve our conditional district rezoning request. After Mr. Adams is finished, all of us on the team that I mentioned before will, of course, be available for, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you all for your time and consideration tonight. Mr. Mayor, Council, um, thank you. My name is Danny Adams. Uh, I'm a principal and a director of design with LS3P. Uh, I'm also a uh, resident of the city of Wilmington and wanted to spend just a little bit of time to do an overview to talk about the aspirations of this project and some of the principle and rationale that went into our current thinking on the planning. Uh, Jeff Walton talked a little bit about the site. You know it. Um, it's extremely underutilized um, right now. Um, you know, I'll skip ahead to this side, it shows a little better. Um, our project really is trying to create a diverse, vertically integrated mixed-use project. Um, it will step down in scale, moving to the east as you um, drive down Wilshire Boulevard, but it also really tries to be a, a trailblazer as an urban um, scale building in this area. Um, it's trying to do the opposite from what a lot of the existing development has done, which is create areas of surface parking between the right-of-ways and the buildings. Um, you can see here that we have um, basically three buildings. In the main building, we have um, approximately 250 multifamily units. Um, we have three-story lower-scaled buildings in the back that are an, an additional 48 units. Um, in the front of the uh, property fronting College Road. We have ground level retail around a festival um, mixed use courtyard. In the center of the block, we have structured parking that will serve both retail visitors as well as the residents in combination with a variety of surface parking that's um, integrated into this. So, so what are some of the big ideas that we're trying to achieve with this? Um, I mean, we started out to create something unique and different. Um, there are some aspirational projects. This is Bethesda Row um, in Bethesda, Maryland, which is right outside Washington, D.C. And this diverse, integrated mixed use that creates a sense of place that is really visible um, to people that are going to come here as outside visitors was a big part of what we were trying to do as a gesture towards College Road. You can see another example of this um, also in suburban Washington, D.C. This is Pentagon Row, which is in Arlington, Virginia. Again, trying to create a space that is as much of a public place um, as it is a retail place. Some of the other things that we're um, looking to do, we want to create active articulated facades to the architecture. Um, obviously, having eyes on the street is an important way that um, we can activate the faces of the building as well as break the scale of them down. And we're intentionally thinking about the spaces in between the buildings being as much a part of the design as we are the buildings themselves. So there are intentional ways that we're creating a, a sense of use and scale in areas in between the buildings. The, the mixed use component um, is not something that we feel is a token thing. Um, we feel that it, it, it really has a lot of vibrant possibility because of its location along College Road. So looking at the architecture to really open up um, the visibility to and from that retail is a big part of what we're doing. And how it flanks this um, retail courtyard is a big part of the design gesture towards College Road. This is a, a really an old-fashioned way of looking at development, but thinking about this project as a streetscape-oriented um, approach to having actual walk-up stoops to some of the ground floor units, and again, creating real streetscapes with sidewalks, with street trees, with on-street parking. Um, you know, this is something that neighborhoods did a long time ago that we wanted to bring back into this. 
And obviously there'll be private amenities um, that will be a big part. So balancing out how the residents can have a sense of security and privacy with their amenities, coupled with the retail courtyard is, a, is an, again, another part of the project. Um, I'll leave with this. Um, this is a rendering that shows um, that opening to what we're referring to as Paseo, which is promenade um, in Spanish. Um, you see Wilshire Boulevard here on the right and College Road on the left, um, and really trying to do something that is um, just a, a really you know, trailblazing, unique thing here on the site. So if you have any questions. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Barnett, I um, just want to follow up on Councilman O'Grady's question about, um, I understand that you have been um, asked about getting across college. What, what's your response? Well, currently there is a striped um, pedestrian connection across on the south side of the intersection. Um, you know, because that is a DOT controlled road, um, obviously there'll be a lot of considerations and, and you know, other con you know, people that we'd have to coordinate with about how traffic is impacted and pedestrian um, connectivity. Um, I, I think that, you know, again, Mr. Bennett is here and, and could speak to that um, as a constraint, but by and large, I think we would want to do whatever was within the realm of possibility to increase and promote a safe pedestrian way to get across College Road. Any other questions? Is uh, Mr. Bennett going to speak? Or are you going to have Ms. speak? Is Mr. Bennett part of your team? Yeah. I, I guess since a, a lot of the, the discussion has focused around the um, crossing of, of uh, College Road there uh, and the concerns that Council has about that, can you kind of uh, enlighten us a little bit, Mr. Bennett? Yes, sir. As mentioned, a TIA was done for the project. Unfortunately, the TIA process does not typically include the pedestrian accommodations. Those are more along the signal design and the TRC type evaluation of it. What we would notice, it is not uncommon on College Road to pick an approach with which that pedestrian movement will run. For example, at Kmart, Randall, New Center, Peachtree, and Lake, there is a crossing across College Road on the south side of the intersection. At Hearst and University, those crossings are on the north side. What you typically will do is cross your pedestrian concurrent with the movement that has the least turning movements mm. that will be crossing that pedestrian crossing. So to get from this site to the Harris Theater across the road, pedestrians would walk parallel to College Road to the south, push the button. The button will stop College Road completely for approximately 45 to 50 seconds. Sufficient time for a pedestrian to walk across the street. When College Road goes green again, the pedestrian will be able to walk from the corner, the southwest corner, to the McDonald's corner, and then over to the Harris Teeter. Gotcha. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. So you, you're, Don, I want to make sure I'm clear on this because we, we've had a lot of interaction over the years. You're telling me that there's a button at Wilshire and College that stops all movement except pedestrian? No, sir. Okay, because the turns are still going. I, I, I just wanted to make sure we were clear, because if, if, if we've got it there, we sure as hell need to get it up at Randall Parkway. And that is the case, sir. Is Randall Parkway, the pedestrian crossing, is on the south side of the intersection. Yes, sir. The heaviest left turning movement at Randall Parkway, of course, is coming from mm -hmm. Randall Parkway from the west to proceed north on College yeah. Road. That's a permitted movement. In the absence of conflicting traffic exiting UNCW, that movement can turn across that crosswalk right. while it runs with that, with that. So I understand that. I just wanted right. to make sure I didn't misunderstand something that you said. I, exactly. I got it. So Don, um, DOT would probably look unfavorably to have two pedestrian crossing, one on the south end and one on the north end with the, with, the, with the left turn movements coming out of Wilshire going north on college. Well, those are the heaviest left turn movements, but this intersection is I, what's called split phased. Okay. Okay, meaning when College Road goes red. I understand. 
Uh, in the normal sequence, Wilshire Boulevard coming from the project side would go green. And because of the demand there, that's going to take around 14 to 15 seconds, and that should clear out all of the vehicles. Then it will go over to Wilshire Boulevard from the west. So, so the only move we're talking about coming out of Wilshire that would be a concern for pedestrian would be if a, a right turn movement from Wilshire going south on College. That is correct. That movement would con the would conflict with the pedestrian movement. Okay. But that is that is one of the lighter movements on that approach. But you have never have you ever seen the DOT accept two pedestrian crossings, one north, one south, in the same intersection with that left turn movement? Not where you have split phasing. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. okay. Mr. Barnett. So just clarity, you're saying then that once this project is built, people will be able to walk down. Yeah, south to Wilshire, right? Push a button, cross over, and then get to the McDonald's, push another button and cross over again and get to the Harris Teeter. I'm just No sir. Um, the the crossings parallel to College Road do not have signals. They are striped, but they do not have signals. Mm -hmm. College Road in the absence of all traffic will recall or rest in College Road Green. And during the time that it is recalls to green, the pedestrian can just walk concurrent with the green like it does at pretty much any intersection where we have a marked crosswalk, but do not have the pedestrian heads. Dylan, that, 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 that approach does not work for Wilshire Boulevard because there is no way to stop College Road except for vehicular demand on Wilshire Boulevard. So if we were looking late in the evening, uh, pedestrian does midnight run to Harris Teeter coming back, if there was nobody sitting on Wilshire Boulevard, exactly, if there was nobody sitting on Wilshire Boulevard, they would have no way to stop College Road. The button allows them to push that button, stop College Road for approximately 40 to 50 seconds while they cross over, and it is a, it is a signaled crossing. They get a walk for approximately seven seconds, and then they get a flash and don't walk so, such that the last able-bodied person that steps off the curb uh, leaving either side has enough time to get over to the other side before anything is really screen. So Don, you're talking that's what it should be, but those buttons aren't there now, right? No, those buttons are there right now. Yes, sir. Those were installed by city engineering as part of a project, uh, probably six months before my retirement in June of 2020. The project also installed a crossing on the north side of Wilshire Boulevard at Carr Avenue. The same project did both crossings. So those buttons exist today. And if, uh, if Dylan could pull up the street view, I believe the most recent street view will actually show the pedestrian heads and buttons. It right there? Isn't that the crosswalk? I see it right here. There we go. Yes, sir. You can see the, uh, by the wooden pole over on the right, uh, immediately past the Honda Accord or the Volkswagen Jetta, uh, you can see the red, the yellow pedestrian head about halfway up the pole facing the east. And then on the other side, you can see a small silver pole with a yellow head and that one faces back to the west. So that infrastructure is existing today. And that's sufficient to stop that traffic long enough for them to cross? That is sufficient not only to provide a walk signal for approximately seven seconds, but the last pedestrian that steps off of the curb ramp walking at three and a half feet per second, which is a very slow walking pace for the average person. Um, they will be on the other side of the road prior to any, excuse me, prior to College Road going green again. Ms. Yeah. Haynes. Um, I go through there all the time, so I get what, what you're talking about. I think this is a beautiful project. I mean, it's just really, looks great um won't the pedestrian and traffic pattern change when you get all these people in here and so you might have more left turns of people coming out of the project and turning uh left to go south on college i mean we don't know but it seems to me you're going to put an awful lot of people in there and so maybe that's going to change the pattern and 
and then the crosswalk could be changed to the other to the northern part of College Road rather than on the south. I have the traffic volumes from the traffic study for the potential build volumes to give you a comparison of potential volumes. During the AM peak, it's projected to be 161 left turns off of Wilshire Boulevard from the west to head north on College Road. In the PM peak, that's projected to be 215. The maximum left turn coming off of the Wilshire Boulevard side from the project is in the PM at 46. How can that be? That's based on the trip generation and the peak hour, uh, peak hour distributions. Spears? I, I miss, I mean, I think this is nice too, but Don, Mr. Bennett, because I'm not going to call you Don because you weren't here when I got on, on council, but I don't believe anybody's going to make it across college in the time you stated. I, 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 that's not, I just don't believe that. And I, I get that you're the expert, but I've attended UNCW. I used to live by UNCW. Um, I'm often traveling down South College and that Wilshire and college right there by McDonald's gets crazy. And so I think by the time, whatever the time allowed for the person who pushes that button is left in the middle of South College Road trying to cross over. The technical standard from the North Carolina Department of Transportation Signal Design Manual specifies where you have a pedestrian crosswalk, you must account for, take the total distance of the crosswalk, divide it by 3.5 feet per second, which is the 95th percentile walking speed for most pedestrians. Only 5% of people walk slower than that and that time must clear them across from, from ramp to ramp. I hear you, but I'm just not buying it. Now, if one does not push the button and one attempts to cross with, just cross with vehicular traffic, there's nothing to hold that movement green for that pedestrian. As soon as the vehicular traffic disappears, it will cycle through. So if one does attempt to cross without pushing the button, that could be a case where they're only going to get as much time as the vehicles hold that vehicle green and they will be walking against the upraised hand. Yeah, I, I hear you. I'm just not, I mean, I'm a pretty fit guy and sometimes when I hit the button right outside here, I mean, I'm getting a hand before I get, what, what is that, 305 over there? I, I'm getting a hand before I get there so I could just imagine how anybody else would feel. Is it a flashing hand or a solid hand? And it's solid by the time, I mean, I, I'm breaking the law by the time I get to the other side. Okay. <laughs> I just, I don't know, I'm not buying it. Ms. Anderson. And is, I thought I heard you say, I, I mean, we can look at this overhead, not who knows what the date is or if it, how current it is, but you, you can see the, when you get over here to the, when you cross, if you cross college, is there then again a, uh, would you just be walking with traffic or is there a, um, the button and so forth across Wilshire? There are striped crosswalks across both, both approaches of Wilshire Boulevard. So, and in North Carolina, the lateral extension of the sidewalk constitutes the legal crosswalk marked or not. So you're saying that that is now marked? That is marked. As it is shown in the aerial uh, that we have here, you can see the preliminary markings on the ground. Those have been since made permanent. So now, it's, now it's horizontal or whatever, perpendicular stripes there. Is that what you're saying? Those are just the parallel bars, just parallel stripes. Okay. And those are unsignaled, again, because College Road automatically goes back to green. The pedestrians, like many traffic signals around town where we don't even have the walk-don't-walk walk signals, just walk with the green. Oh, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Rombard. 
I don't know where this will get addressed at here or TRC or what, but I want the people that are doing this to know that we like it. I like it. I think it's beautiful. And nobody up here is more um, attuned to traffic, getting people, pedestrians and bikers across a busy intersection than I am. But this can be fixed. I know it can be fixed to, to satisfy everybody. Um, it, it, uh, I mean, we're not going to get a skywalk there. We're trying as hard as we can to get one somewhere further up college, but um, it's uh, that that uh, project that you mentioned six months before you retired. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to remember when Jeff was up here making his presentation. I knew there was something that we had done to improve that at Wilshire, Carr and Wilshire South College. Um, but that's obviously something that you see the concern up here, but that project is so pretty and uh, not like anything we've got here. So I don't want them to get discouraged and think this is going to be a mountain they can't climb. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Anderson. Sir. As the applicant, I mean, thank you, Don. Okay. The, has the applicant completed their presentation or do they have more? You didn't? Okay, can I have the lady who opened up the, the attorney? Don, don't go anywhere. Just hang in there for a second. <laughs> I got to stand six feet from you. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I understand. Uh, go ahead. A statement you made, I'd like you to clarify for okay. me if you could. You're saying this is not for students. It's not necessarily for students. So, I mean, a lot the of... The target is not students. Mm -mm. There's well, a you lose me there. So, it's not... Because that's word. why I like it. <laughs> well, then it is. No, I'm just kidding. It certainly... Students will not be discouraged from living here. It's just that... Are you pricing them out? No. I think that it's just th that there are a lot of... There's a lot of the population growth driven by UNCW that's not just students. There's lots of... Oh, I understand that, but... So, that was our only I mean, point. is it going to be, you know... You know, you know, two thousand dollars a bedroom type of thing. I mean, are we price? It's it's either. I mean, the whole idea of, uh, under in our plan for this the Kmart area, this area was to try to create camp, you know, housing right. so the kids would stay on that side of the be on that, that and and the counter argument to the to the grocery store is how many more trips are they going to go to campus, which is what we really ought to be worried about than the grocery store. I mean, so, I mean. They're on that side of the road with the campus. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a positive. I mean, that's a, that's, so, I, I'm, so I'm just you. a little confused. No, no, I'm with you. I understand to, what you're saying. I, I mean, just. The whole Kmart thing was to be developed to probably, create a Granville Towers-ish thing right. of Chapel Hill. And it, or, I'm and not my, saying it's solely students, but right. if you're going to price them No, I mean, my or, understanding is that the Kmart, and I certainly am not involved in that. I don't know. But oh, I understand. But, but it but will I, be, it, likely. On our, on, our, on our comp plan, there is a. A, right. uh, there's a Understood. schematic drawing. There's a whole major rendering of that. And this is more or less the same location. So. Right. And I do think that we are trying to distinguish ourselves in, I mean, this is a, we personally are very proud of it. The design it's gorgeous. And, and how it looks and, and what it will do for this area because it's been sitting there for so long. So many different large areas in this little pocket. And so the reason I said that, and I, I, the reason I wanted to make a point of that when I first spoke, was because there was concern expressed by one of the council members about the students, it being you know, full of students running across the street. And I just felt it was important to right. put out there that this is not like a, an exclusively student right. housing but project. But you can see how excited I would be that the students are on that side of the street yes. with the campus, going back and forth to class. You've got places for them to grab coffee, eat right underneath them, I and it, it's it's perfect for a UNCW student. Okay, it just confused me. I understand, and if I don't know if, if any of the others want to speak to that, but that's no. what I would right. say about that. Anybody else have questions about no, that? I just have a question for Don real quick. Okay. Uh, to, to Kevin's point in regards to the crossing of, of, of College Road, um, I know there is always standards to, to traffic and traffic control. Um, if you wanted to add some, some time onto that clock to cross, could you? That would be the purview, and that would be the purview of the North Carolina Department of Transportation okay. to allow that. Again, as stated earlier, the intersection is a state intersection. Yeah. So there was a mention of 55 seconds or something. What, what was the? Uh, well, 
again, again, it is based on how wide the road is. So if you go up the road a little farther, of right. course, co uh, College Road is widening out as it moves north in this sure. case. Um, you add additional lanes as you go farther north. So those pedestrian times up there are longer, but it's just because there's physically more road to cross. Okay. Because there's a lot of crossing up on um, up the street there, right, where a lot of kids are crossing there at the university. Yes, sir. That, that, um, that, that's, the, that's right before I retired, there was a crossing installed on the south side of New Center. Uh, there has been the existing crossing on the south side of Randall for years, and uh, recently nor uh, crossings parallel to College Road, Cross sure. City Trail, and trying sure. to get bikes back to the right side sure. of the road there. Okay. So we, um, if we wanted to add more time, that would be something that the department would have to review and, and then evaluate and then make that decision based on that. Correct. The North Carolina Department of Transportation would have to uh, approve that request. And then, of course, a traffic signal design would have to be done to reflect it. Okay. And then you've got islands that have been put at a lot of our key intersections. Uh, what are they called? Is that what they're called? Uh, pedestrian refuges. Uh, there are cases where um, pedestrians are allowed to cross to a refuge in the middle. And then they have a separate set of buttons there they would, they would press. Uh, in this case, I don't believe there's enough medium width yeah. uh, on either side to accommodate that kind of uh, that kind of crossing. Okay, very good. All right, thank, thank you, you, Don. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. At this time, I'm going to open up the public hearing and ask if anybody in the public wishes to speak on this item. I'm sorry, if I may. The applicant wants to say it just address you for one moment if that's okay that's fine okay. good evening mayor good evening mm -hmm. council members my name is mariana molina and i am here on behalf of one of the developers of the project bella vista development group um craig davis of craig davis properties is also here um who is my husband and is the other developer of this project and um, I just want to um, impart upon you that we, Wilmington is our community as well, and we are not going to attempt to develop a project that's going to put anybody in harm. And so if and when the time comes to look into these types of issues, we are absolutely more than willing to work with you and, and adhere to the standards that have been set by the NCDOT to do what, what, what we need to do in order to make this a safe community for, um, for everybody. Um, so I, I hope that that is not um, going to impact your decision this evening because we are committed to this community and to the safety of its residents. We appreciate that, and of course. just because with the, the with the amount of traffic that we, or walkable traffic that is going back and forth from the university to the other side, of course, we've had a lot of concerns um, from folks, and um, rightfully so. And so, yes. and I know that you don't control North Carolina Department of Transportation, neither do we. So it is something that would be a, a work in progress, and I would imagine that the department is is about safety and whatever it would take to make that crossing safe. We're okay. With. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. So the public hearing is now open, and anybody wishes to speak, come forward and speak for the record. Okay. Seeing none, are there any comments that we've received, Madam Clerk? Okay. Seeing none, are there any further questions from Council? Okay. I'm going to close the public hearing and ask for the wishes of council. We have a motion to approve by Councilmember Barnett, second by Councilmember Anderson. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Consistency oh, statement. consistency statement. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Barnett. I move to approve the proposed amendment, rezone the property located at 821 and 827 South College and 4881 and 4885 Wilshire Boulevard from RB Regional Business and RBCD, Regional Business Conditional District, to UMX CD, Urban Mixed Use Conditional District, for a mixed use development with 298 residential units, 15,000 square feet of retail, a 364 space parking deck, and 94 surface parking spaces, and finally to be consistent with the relevant policies in the comprehensive plan. 
based on the application materials and the information provided at the public hearing and in the staff report. And the final approval of the rezoning request is reasonable and in the public interest for the following reasons. The proposed rezoning provides additional housing and commercial services on the east side of College Road near the UNCW campus and along a high priority transit route. I'll favor that motion. Please indicate by saying aye. Okay. That item passes unanimously on first reading. Is there a motion to waive second reading? Motion made by Councilman Manners and second by Councilman Rivenbark. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item passes unanimously on first as well as second reading. Okay. That brings us to our next item of business, which is item PH3, which is an ordinance submitting the official zoning map of the city to rezone property containing 7.719 acres of land located at 4903 Market Street from RB Regional Business to MFHCD multifamily high density conditional district for a 234 unit apartment complex. At this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Tony Carter, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Walton, I overthrew you this project for us as well. According to the Wilmington City Directory, a Holiday Inn Motel oper operated at the site as early as 1975. Uh, changes have occurred over time since, and the current franchise is a Budgetel Inn. The City of Wilmington filed a legal action against the property in 2016, claiming that the property was a nuisance based upon a lengthy history of violations of controlled substances. Um, on the premises as well as loitering and prostitution. The New Heron County Superior Court entered a consent judgment and final order of abatement with regard to the property on July 18th, 2016. The judgment order prevents any current or future property owner from maintaining a nuisance anywhere on the property. The order also presents, uh, prevents the property from ever being used as any type of private club which might attract similar gatherings of people. Uh, this uh, gives you an overview of where the property is located on Market uh, in, near South Car Avenue, um, adjacent to Abbott's Run um, and near the food line. These are some of the photos of the subject site itself of the current operations as a Budgetel Inn. Uh, some adjacent properties um, just uh, along uh, Market Street, as well as uh, the apartments that are on McClellan Drive to the rear. The applicant proposes to rezone the site from RB res Regional Business to Multifamily H, uh, Multifamily High Density Conditional District, to allow for the conversion of existing 224 room hotel use to a 234 unit apartment complex. A 10,500 square foot office and amenity area is also proposed within the existing front lobby and former restaurant space. No new construction is proposed. The proposed apartment complex would use the existing buildings, infrastructures, utilities, and amenities as is. The proposal would also provide a new street yard area, which would require the removal of several parking spaces, enclosing one existing driveway on Market Street. A, um, a new pedestrian connection is also proposed from the public sidewalk to the building entrance. Market Street is currently operating level service of F. A NCDOT sponsored widening project of Market Street is proposed along the subject site and is in the design phase. Along the frontage of the subject site, a raised concrete median is proposed, eliminating all left turns in and out of the property and construction is expected to start in 2029. The comprehensive plan supports development that is consistent with the context of the surrounding area. The subject site is located along a major corridor and regional parkway complete street and a high capacity transit route. The site is located near a variety of an existing commercial uses and services. The proposed increase in density along the existing wave transit facility on Market Street would be an opportunity to increase the ridership on an existing transit route. The proposed multifamily zoning presents an appropriate transition from commercial areas along Market Street 
to the existing multifamily uses along the, to the north and east along McClellan Drive. The site presents an opportunity to provide affordable housing units and the applicant has proposed 10% or 23 units of the project to be designated as workforce housing for a period of 15 years. The workforce housing proposal would also allow the site to accommodate different income levels and not just concentrate a single income in a concentrated area. The proposed zoning map amendment is consistent with the Great Wilmington Comprehensive Plan and the city's adopted focus areas. Staff police request is reasonable and in the public interest, and we recommend com conditional approval subject to the conditions in the case summary. I'll be happy to answer your questions, and I believe the applicant is also here tonight. Okay, Mr. Anderson. Ooh. Jeff, I have a few for you. I've had a hard time getting my arms around this one. Um, you know, I, I guess in some of these you may pass to the, uh, to the developer, but I, I would like staff's take on them because you all reviewed it and recommended it. Um, you know, hotels built for what, I don't know, in my mind, two nights a week, you know, that's kind of what it's designed for. You, the, you mentioned there's no new construction. So they just, it's just, we're basically just rezoning it. Hotel rooms are gonna come a house, somebody's home. Sure, um, so they are rezoning it. No kitchens, I mean, uh, no, I mean that's it. They, they will be doing interior renovations to my knowledge. Uh, they will be doing um, interiors. The interiors will be renovated for small kitchen facilities, the bedroom, living room, and the bathrooms themselves. So I think the applicant can probably go into more details. Okay, what fair enough is. on that one. The, the, the street yard, you know, we, that, that part of Market Street, really most of Market Street, once you get out past the Y, is not terribly attractive. So what we're not... The, by this change, it does not require them, and there's no conversation to plant a tree or two. Or I mean, we're just going to close off a driveway and, and put a bush or two. I mean, it, it, what's that's it? Oops, I'm trying to get to it. Um, so this site, it's hard to see in this photograph. I drove here. through there. Right. Um, this site was definitely developed well beyond zoning at the time. And I don't have a, a photo here of it. Uh, currently it is a uh, two driveway development with almost little to no green space on, along the front. Right. Um, and so the plan that's proposed by the applicant at least addresses some street yard. It's not a perfect fix in any right. ways. Right, but, but there's, like when you say that, it's vague to me. Does that mean they plant a row of bushes, a tree, or grass, or just- sure. plant they haven't presented a landscape plan to us yet, but the code would require that they would have to plant shrubs and trees addressed along that frontage, as well as a low buffer to block headlights from uh, bleeding onto Market Street. So there would be a three foot hedge, as well as uh, trees and shrubs along that section of Market. Okay. Was there any discussion, is that, I don't know what, I'll, what we'll call that, but the, the back 40, so to speak, the, the area behind the fence, you know, when we used to do multifamily, you know, and, and things change, I can't keep up with all the little regs, but you should have passive, active, uh, you know, what was that called? Parks? What, what do we call that? Sure, it's just open space requirements yeah. that would be required. So there, there was no proposal on their part to open that up or make that accessible? Are you talking about the, the space on the, the rear of the property? It, it, to my knowledge, and maybe the applicant will get into this further, I, I believe a lot of that is uh, considered wet or wetlands. And so the applicant proposed that as passive open space. There is a, a degree of active open space since within the front two buildings, there's an existing pool facility mm -hmm. as well as uh, green space for residents. And so we feel they are meeting the open space requirement of multifamily. Okay, well, I'll, I'll ask more questions of, sure. the, of that, but thank you. Mr. Grady. Okay, there's a reference in here about um, affordable housing, and I didn't understand the reference uh, to um, high HUD, whatever it is. Translate it into what we usually do, which is based on uh, the uh, 
minimum uh, uh, average wage. Um, we usually do 60 percent, 80 percent. I just don't understand what the what what when they say affordable housing, what's the percent of the average uh, wage? It's it's based on income, but I don't know the percentages. I have to look to Brian and see. I just like to know what's committed to. So later on, when we say, "Gee, you didn't hit sixty percent," they said, "Oh no, we meant eighty percent of yeah. average sure. minimum." Councilman O'Grady. Yeah. Um, it's our, the way we're defining workforce housing is by the HUD high home the home rent um, standards, which I believe is eighty percent AMI. AMI. So it's eighty okay. percent. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Sound like to recognize the applicant. Hello again. For the record, I'm Cindy Wolf, and here on behalf of the owner and the developer. This petition is certainly an interesting proposal compared to what we customarily bring forward as multifamily development in our community. And as Jeff described, the proposal is redevelopment of two existing motels historically used for transient lodging, but now intended for residential rental. Intervivo, um, this is a group of developers that now have facilities in several states all over the country, and it's an interesting dynamic. Their program acknowledges that renters are constantly seeing regular increases in the price of housing through gentrification, um, increased demand in virtually every urban center of the country. At the same time, some of the older hotels are seeing lower demand, and when in competition with newer facilities, location obviously plays a major role in their occupancy, especially in a resort community like we are. People want to be closer to the beach. There's constantly new hotels being built. The city has identified a well-established need for um, this level termed as workforce housing intended to be better available to our and based on our more affordable rental costs. The problem is that under the current development sector, the housing product that's necessary to fill that need doesn't really exist. Property is expensive, new construction is costly, and the end result is higher market rate rents. Vivo has introduced a solution by converting low demand hotels into micro apartment complexes that are pre-furnished and able to provide the same class A amenities as other apartment complexes while retaining the existing hotel amenities like the pool, the lounge areas, gyms, and business centers. Meanwhile, pricing to renters is in the lower range because of the compact unit size and the management can make a project more successful because of the increased number of units. Hates me. The redevelopment will primarily be internal to the buildings with the exception of the frontage. And Mr. Anderson, I think this is what you were asking about. The, when the driveway is closed at the front, everything that is up front there will turn into green space and it will meet the current criteria for street yard landscaping, which as Jeff pointed out will include include trees and shrubs, and a low buffer along the parking spaces. Some of the architectural change, some architectural change will be made in that Port Cachere to give it a little bit more residential look. It's a, you know, a huge drop-off area now. The western driveway, as we said, would be abandoned, thereby reducing turning conflicts along Market Street and improving overall access management. I believe one of the most important features of this proposal is its location. Several of the growth strategies and, and policies for the Create Wilmington plan promote integrating residential development into existing commercial areas as a way to help reduce reliance on motor vehicles. We call it horizontal mixed use. Adding residents within an existing commercial node promotes non-transit oriented use and even reduction of parking needs. There is a multitude of shopping and eating establishments within easy walkability of this complex. 
Public transit will be another high point of it and a positive feature. The location is central within the city along four public transit routes. There's a covered stop directly in front of this site and a crosswalk at Low Water just east of the site that allows access to the, the route stop on the opposite side of wave travel and also for the Seahawk shuttle. Princess Place, Market Street, they both provide uh, those lines both provide access between Paget Station, which is downtown, and Forden Station, which is at North College. Those are transfer facilities, thereby giving broader access to the entire wave transit system. Medical Center accesses the hospital area and the regional shopping node at the intersection of Independence and Oleander. The Shipyard Boulevard route avails the shop, that same shopping area, and takes you all the way across town to public port facilities. The city's efforts to provide safe cycling throughout the community are constantly adding the, to the variety and interconnectivity of bike trails and other accommodations. An abundance of secure bicycle parking racks or lockers will be dispersed around the complex for easy access to the multiple entrances. The improvement along Market Street to Carr Avenue intersection has included upgrading the public sidewalks that were already there. Now they're a little wider. They're certainly not broken up and cracked. And now there are bike lanes along Carr Avenue. These are some of the pictures of other Vivo apartment complexes. And you can see the quality of the renovations and the lifestyle appointments. Each room, which is currently a bedroom and a separate bathroom, will have a kitchenette and full size. I mean, you can see this. It's cabinetry, a full stove, your sink, and that looks like a dishwasher. Um, these are furnished, and so those types of things would be included as they're showing here. The pool is already there. Um, it would be upgraded. And the interior space of this particular facility that had a restaurant has more than adequate space in the lounges and in that restaurant area to create a gym, to create a business center, and an activity area for the residents. We believe that the rents for the rooms of this apartment complex will be what Vivo calls naturally affordable based on the location and the size of the units. Regardless, they have committed to designating 10% of the units to meet that criteria of the workforce housing uh, standards, and that is what we've been using lately, 80% of the AMI, which is the high rent for 80% AMI for the minimum of 15 years. Incorporating the combination of the market rate and this more controlled rate also meets the strategies, as Jeff pointed out, of not concentrating all low-income housing in the same place. To close, we believe that this is consistent, reasonable in the public interest, and we hope you'll agree with the Planning Commission's uh, unanimous recommendation of approval along with the staffs. Thank you. Question, Mr. Spears. Ten percent for 15 years, 230 units, 23 units. That gets the developer what? What? It? There's 234 rooms. 234 and but, 23 would be then. But still, deeming this project affordable gets the developer what? I mean, what, what are they getting for this? I know, I, I know there's some type of incentive that we give for affordable housing, so. No, this isn't no, tax credit nothing. or, I mean, we're, there's no incentive. The, the city is getting the 10% that generally in market rate, you know, it depends on where it is and how badly they want their approval, but most market rate developers fight against dedicating it necessarily. Um, this one, we are setting aside the 10%. Okay. Councilman it, Spears, I think what you're referring to is in the new code, we have a new multi-dwelling unit oh, 10 and multi-dwelling unit 17. And in both those districts, there is an incentive for workforce housing that basically removes the density cap of those districts. This is coming to you before that code is being implemented. So you're, you're working on the, the current um, ordinances. So nothing. 
But it still is 10 percent. It, it's still 10 percent. That's correct. I, I'm not I'm not downing that yeah. at all. But it's that's that's the difference here. We've got we're going current code versus the new code that's effective on December I got you. one. I got you. So, so we're so technically meeting the new code. We're yeah. meeting the current code and we're meeting the new code. Yeah, but Cindy, I'll just be honest, 10% is not much, very much. It, and these, you're talking about 10% of, so we're going from tiny homes to tiny rooms. This is a tiny room. This it is. I mean, it's the new wave. Uh, yes, it's just 10%, but keep in mind that at that size, these are efficiency apartments. But you no, also said, you also said, there was a workforce housing aim, target, mm -hmm. right? So workforce housing, the people with families can't live here. You, you're talking no. about single, single workforce mm -hmm. housing. That's correct. So people who just are not home very often just go home, take a, take a shower, eat a little bit and go to sleep and then wake up and go, go again. Well, in this location, they have a variety of places they can go to be entertained, to eat. Um, to me, it's people like college, they've come out of college, they're tired of having roommates. They want to live alone, but they can't afford $1,200 of rent for your market rate, one bedroom, even one bedroom apartment somewhere. And so this is an alternative that I think is really lacking in our community. We have one bedrooms, we have twos and threes, um, we have townhomes. We don't have really efficiency apartments unless there's some downtown. But surprisingly enough, they thought that the majority of their tenants, now that they're all over the country, would be in that under 30 range, basically 20 to 30 years old. What they've actually found is about 40% of their tenants are in that 20 to 30 range, and actually another 40% are over 55. These are seniors. Now in a particular case like this, two seniors, uh, maybe they want a link to Wilmington, but they want to travel the country part of the year. They keep this link, they have a place to live together, and it is affordable. Well, that might have been a better angle. Senior, senior affordable house. I well, I mean, we're, we're not trying to limit it, but it is, if you think about the size of the unit, they're not going to glean $1,100 a month rents. So if they're down in that $900 range for a single bedroom apartment or an efficiency, that is pretty darn close to the affordable that the 10% is limiting. I guess, I mean, you, you're talking about a, an old motel that's known for drugs and prostitution that now someone wants to live there for 900 a month and call it affordable living. I, well, I, once it's improved, all the rooms get redone, the sprinkler system, the, the amenity areas. I mean, that's what this group does. And they've been very successful with it in other locations. All right. Okay. Mr. Anderson. I like it. Well, I guess I've, I've started to learn some, some, a lot. There's some good stuff. I'm, I'm curious, this, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to pick the order of which it would be the I may cut off a lot of other questions, yeah. but the, the furnished piece, they're all furnished, is that right, Cindy? Yes. And you, so is there a, uh, I'm trying to figure out how many people might be living in one is where I'm headed. So, okay. So do we have a- 90% uh, of them are single occupancy. But is it, are we, are we talking about, so there's gonna be a, maybe a queen size bed in there? Or are we talking about uh, two queens? You, no, you no, them? I mean, it's single occupancies. Uh, I mean, the majority is single occupancy. There is a bed. I suspect it would be a queen bed in this day and age. I mean, the queen bed was there when it was a motel. So, so a couple, but I'm mean, saying if a, single occupancy. What you mean? No, one I'm talking. Ninety percent of their tenants are one person, okay. which is typical of an efficiency. However, they have found that. 40% of their occupants are also over 55. And I, I'm just, it was just sort of that, me that, saying, I could see an older couple. No, that's that all, that's all helpful to me. What I'm, what I'm getting at is uh, a family shows up with three children no. and they want to lease it, and even though there's one bed. I mean, because people are trying to find no, a no, place no, to no. live. They it's, don't do it that. It is very close, it's managed. It is on site management and they don't rent to families. Okay, well that, that, that heads off a lot of questions. I, I'm still just curious, so 
you know, I'm just putting myself, I'm living there on the, and I want to walk my dog. That's what I, that back area is for. I it's mean, it's fenced off. You can't get to it. That was my question. Why can't you get to it? There's fence all the way around. Oh, well, that's part of the renovations. Okay. Yeah. In the past, that has, I mean, they haven't wanted people going back there and homeless camping out. No, and I get all, all that. But, so you, that, there, that, that. Absolutely. That, that is part of our open space, and part of the requirement right. of open space in our code is to make it accessible. Well, that was not what my man was answered. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Okay. I didn't realize it was fenced off. Okay. Okay. Councilman Barnett? Yeah. I just want to say I like the project. I like the project, and I think that it is going to meet the needs of um, some folks who um, want a place to live. And I do think that once it's renovated and it's, you know, new, it won't be the drug place that it used to be. It's going to be changed. So I think I like it. I really like the project. And, um, I think it's a good deal. I think we, we're um, appreciative of the um, person wanting to give us at least 10% of affordable housing. We thank you for that. Mr. Rumbar? You know, this is a lot like what we had just now. It's new, it's something different, it's a new concept. And this does include all utilities, does it not? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, are you talking about in the rent? Well, I, I mean, mean, yeah, I mean. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you don't pay separately. It won't be sub-metered or anything like that. And, and this is well-managed on-site? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. This time I'm going to open up the public hearing and ask if anyone in the public wishes to speak on item PH3. Seeing none, are there any further questions or any comments, um, Madam Clerk, that you have received at the clerk's office? Okay. Hearing none, I will close the public hearing and ask for the wishes of counsel. And I would also uh, make the comment that whoever makes the motion must read a, a consistency statement for the record. We have a, let me just, uh, we have a motion to approve by Councilman Ravenbark, second by Councilman Barnett. Mr. Reinbach, will you please read the consistency statement? Yes, sir. I move to approve the proposed amendment to, excuse me, I move to approve the proposed amendment to rezone the property located at 4903 Market Street from RV Regional Business to multifamily dash high density CD multiple family high density conditional district to allow the conversion of an existing 224 room hotel used to a 234 unit apartment complex and find it to be consistent with the relevant policies in the comprehensive plan based on the application materials and the information provided at the public hearing and in the staff report and to find approval of the rezoning request as reasonable and in the public interest for the following reasons. The proposed rezoning provides additional workforce housing options and greater residential density along a high priority transit route. The rezoning provides an appropriate transition from the commercial areas along Market Street to the existing multiple family uses to the north and east. All right, all in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item passes. Are you, how are, you for, are you voting in the affirmative? Okay, so that passes six to one. Is there a motion to waive second reading? Motion made by Mayor Pro Tem Haynes, second by Councilman McGrady. Discussion, all in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Aye, any opposed? That item passes unanimously. Okay, that brings us to our next item of business, which is our ordinances. Um, I will announce that item 01 is a second, ring, second reading continued from August 3rd, 2021 meeting. And the ordinance is directing the housing inspector to vacate, close, and repair or demolish a dwelling at 518 North 11th Street as unfit for human habitation pursuant to Article 5, Chapter 16 of the City Code and directing that a notice be placed thereon prohibiting its use or occupancy. At this time, I'd like to recognize our City Manager, Mr. Caudill. Mr. Caudill. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As a second reading, we don't have a presentation prepared for you this evening. Mr. Brian Renner, our Chief Code Enforcement Officer, is available to answer questions. Okay, are there any further questions from Council in respect to the item? Yes, sir, Mr. Barnett. Has there been any change? Have you heard anything from 
any family members or anything? Yeah, first let me say good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. Um, I did speak with the executor of the estate. Um, basically, verbatim, it's a mess, is what they said in terms of the estate. Um, they're still sorting it out um, with an attorney. Um, the problem is, is they're currently in Los Angeles and they're trying to manage stuff in DC and North Carolina as well as some other locations um, within this estate. Um, so the, the family is not opposed to the demolition of the property. Um, they were here in August for the funeral and they've seen the property and they actually pulled copies of the notices at that time. Um, I d didn't hear from them until I hunted them down and, and called them. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with it. Mm -hmm. okay. Ms. Spears? So they're not opposed to it being demoed? Correct. Are they looking to do it or are they looking for us to do it? They have said that because the, the property is not in clear title that they will not do anything with the property. So they are not opposed to us demolishing the property based on my conversation with them. But if we do it, it's going to be... I, I explained that to the executive of the state that there would be a lien placed on the property if the city demolished it. I explained to them our timelines that are outlined in this ordinance. Um, nobody's thrilled about it. I, I would say even the city's not thrilled about having to do this. But if you're familiar with the property, it, it's one of those um, necessities I think that we need to move forward with. Thank you. Any other okay. comments, questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. What are the wishes of council in respect to the, to the ordinance? We have a motion to approve by Councilmember Grady, second by Councilmember Barnett. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That item passes uh, unanimously. Okay. Item 02 is an ordinance appropriating fund balance from the general fund for a grant to support the development of Eden Village of Wilmington, North Carolina. At this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Tony Cottle. Mr. Cottle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our deputy city manager, Mr. Tom Moten, will overview this item. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Thank you for your time today. Uh, this item before you today is a to address an unexpected uh, situation that occurred with the support of the Eden Village. If you recall, City Council approved in April 2021 uh, the sale of the Optimus Park with proceeds from the sale been split between two purposes, one of which was $250,000 from the proceeds to support the site improvements, then $43,000 to the City Council wanted to support the construction of one house for Eden Village. Uh, the remaining funds from the sale would be dedicated towards permanent supportive housing. Uh, through some unexpected and unanticipated uh, series of delays with the transfer of the property, we're making some adjustments, also the market and demand. Uh, we're at a point well beyond what we anticipated we would be. And in talking to Dr. Tom Dalton, who's here today and is the primary uh, party that's supporting Eden Village, uh, thought that council may want to consider helping him move forward with the project with adequate precautions that preserve the taxpayers' money. And at such time as the Optimus Park sales close, we would refund the unassigned fund balance to $250,000 and then also move forward with the uh, support of $43,000 for one house. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And also, Dr. Dalton and one of his counterparts have been here throughout the evening, and I'm sure they would appreciate just a moment of your time to address you. There's a question here. Tom. Mr. Tom. 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 I, I know that when you get down toward closing, there's a whole you know, menu of things that can go wrong. This is certainly something uh, flying the ointment is minor. Well, it, it, the, the biggest part of it was that Paper Street, Dirt Street, and the adjoining property owner, if you recall, right on the eve, the 11th hour, that, that adjoining property owner referenced a concern. And so the title work took a little bit longer, and we are having to make some adjustments for that undeveloped street. It's essentially a dirt street uh, with the adjoining property owner, and that will need to be uh, taken out of the original contract and will return to you at a modified price. But that also means doing uh, survey work twice. Okay. All right. So Thanks. it is fairly simple. And yet, you know, I probably told you I could have said yes, but that is the long and short of it. There's about 
Mm, 15,000, I'm guessing right now, but there's, there's, there's a small portion that needs to be removed from what uh, the port was willing to buy because we cannot convey it. It needs to be remained as a street. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, very good. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Tom Dalton. This is Sean Hayes. We're leading the effort to build Eden Village of Wilmington. As you may know, we're a 501c3, building a tiny home community for the chronically homeless near the Creekwood neighborhood. We've asked for financial assistance to build the infrastructure for our village. And we have commitments from you for the sale of Optimus Park, which you are hoping would total $293,000. We'll take anything that you're willing to give us. And we'll use these funds directly to pay for the infrastructure for our discounted contractors involved in the project. Our infrastructure build has been estimated at $891,000. Our total construction budget is $4.2 million. During this time of fluctuation, actual construction costs are difficult to pin down, but we have some great people working on it. Our construction project is being managed by the engineers at Coastal Land Design, the architectural firm of LS3P, construction company Quarter Thompson Construction, as well as the overall management of the project by Thomas Construction. Most of the work that these groups have done on our behalf have been done in a pro bono fashion for which we are eternally grateful. Any money that you give us will be put to good use and uh, the returns for the city will uh, be multiplied many times. We need your help. I also like to invite all of you to our clubhouse groundbreaking this Saturday, October 9th at 11.30 at 13.02 Cornegay. It's open to the public. We'll be joined by the founders of Eden Village in Springfield, Missouri. We'll have our clubhouse plans on display, an opportunity to tour our model home, some music and food for all. You can also watch some videos about our project at EdenVillageWilmington.org, and we hope you go there. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Yes, Mr. You sure got an impressive team. Thank you. Yeah. It's a, we have over 900 donors, 1,500 people signed up to help. Yeah, that has been the best part of the project, sitting in the chairs in the tiny home with uh, amazing folks throughout our community. Yes. Councilman Barnett? Yeah, I um, just want to say I love the project and especially the uh, wraparound services that you're going to give the people who get into those homes, you know, because you're going to be with them for a whole year, which is um, ideal. I appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. I know you've been working hard on this, and that it's, we greatly appreciate it, and it's one of the initiatives that is trying to help us um, get our handle around some of the homeless issues that we're seeing and have been seeing for quite some time. But I really appreciate your effort on this. It's a good project. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So now with that, we have a motion to approve by Councilmember Spear, second by Councilmember Barnett. Any further discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item passes unanimously. Um, do we have a motion to waive second reading? Motion made by Councilmember Spears, second by Mayor Pro Tem Haynes. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? That item passes unanimously on first as well as second reading. Okay, that brings us to our next item, which is item 03A, which is an ordinance appropriating funds to, to, for the City Hall slash Thaling Hall HVAC improvements project in the amount of $1,596,000. And then item 03B is a resolution awarding a construction contract to Monteith Construction Corporation of Wilmington, North Carolina for the City Hall slash Thaling Hall HVAC improvements project in the amount of $2,400,000. And ninety-seven thousand eight hundred dollars. At this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Tony Caldwell. Mr. Caldwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our public services director, Dave Mays, will overview this project for us. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, the ordinance before you uh, appropriates uh, one hundred seventy-six thousand from installment financing and 1.42 million from the ARP funding that uh, the city received uh, into the project. Um, the resolution awards a contract to Monteith Construction uh, in the amount of $2.497 uh, million. 
Um, this project will basically replace all of the components of the HVAC system uh, within the building. Um, most of those components are in excess of uh, 30, maybe 35 years old. Uh, two main components have already been replaced, that being the chiller as well as the boiler. Some of the improvements that we expect to see from this improve uh, air quality. Um, we're going to have a higher degree of uh, filtration, and we're also being, uh, we're, we'll be introducing outside air into the makeup air that goes into the heating and ventilation system. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, good. I, I'm sorry? Quieter. Quieter, yes, sir. Yeah. Do you have any questions for Dave? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mays. Thank you. What are the wishes of council in respect to uh, the item, the ordinance appropriating the funds for the city hall, Thalian Hall, for one million five hundred ninety-six thousand? We have a motion to approve by Councilman Rivenbark, second by Councilmember Grady. Discussion. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? That item passes unanimously on first reading. Is there a motion to waive second reading? Motion made by Councilmember Rivenbark, second by Councilmember Grady. Discussion. All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The item passes unanimously on second reading. That brings us to our next item, which is item 03B, which is the resolution awarding the construction contract to Monteith Construction Corporation of Wilmington, North Carolina, for the City Hall slash Thaline Hall HVAC improvement project, the amount of $2,497,800. What are the wishes of council in respect to that? We have a motion made by Mayor Pro Tem Haynes, second by Councilmember Barnett. Discussion? All in favor of that motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That item passes unanimously. Okay, that brings us to our next item of business, which is our resolutions. Item R1 is a resolution temporarily modifying the paid leave policy for the city of Wilmington. At this time, I'd like to recognize our city manager, Mr. Tony Cottle. Mr. Cottle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Interim Deputy City Manager Al Raglan will overview this item for us. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, this resolution is to temporarily modify the paid leave policy. And I just want to cover a couple of points with you. Uh, the vacation leave uh, policy has accrual. So an employee can accrue up to two times their annual accrual rate. So let's say a person earns 100 hours a year. Uh, so twice that would be 200 hours that they could, could carry over into the next year. We encourage employees to take at least two weeks of vacation a year just to recharge, work-life balance, that sort of thing. It's what we encourage them to do. Um, if for some reason they do not use those hours over that accrual rate, they lose it. It goes away. So if I would give you an example, that 200 hours I just mentioned is their two times accrual rate. And let's say they've accrued 300 hours. If they don't take the two weeks of vacation, that's 80 hours. So that 300 hours would be reduced by 80. So now they have an accrual of 220 hours. Well, what happens to that 20 hours over the accrual you said? Well, that goes to transferred sick leave. And the transferred sick leave is what they would use. They could use if they got sick. Uh, it is also used that they accumulated over their lifetime that it is used toward their retirement calculation. So let me give an example. Let's say an employee's got 29 and a half years of service. And let's say over those 29 and a half years, they've accrued a half a year of sick time. So now they have, toward the, the calculation, 30 years of service versus 29 and a half years of service. So it goes toward their cal that calculation. What we're asking is, is to temporarily suspend them losing that two weeks that they can't take. And the reason is because of COVID, uh, some staff shortages, uh, we just did not want to do that this year, given this pandemic situation. Uh, and in some cases, there are places like public service, police and fire, Dave's area of public service, that those services have to go on. Even if you're short, short staff, you still got to get that work done. So what we're asking is this year is to suspend that, them losing that two weeks of vacation that they just are just not able to take right now. Okay. Mr. Rambar? Just for this fiscal year we're in, 
this fiscal year and what we're asking is that if this pandemic continues that the city manager have the authority to do that for next year no don't need to come back to us no, yeah don't have to come back to you thanks sir we hope that's not the case but we just i mean this thing keeps fluctuating so we don't know thank you i appreciate it any other questions for al okay okay thank you al what are the wishes of council we have a motion to approve by councilman barnett second by councilman Grady. discussion all in favor of that motion please indicate by saying aye, aye. aye. any opposed item passes unanimously this concludes the regular agenda are there any items brought forward by our city attorney just a brief note in 11 days i will be turning 50 and i will be out that weekend deputy city attorney meredith everhart will be with council on that monday morning briefing just wanted council to have a heads up on that welcome to the 40 club uh, mr cottle babe in the woods nothing yes. else mr mayor madam clerk mr grady um nothing thank you <laughs> mr barnett again want to remind people to continue to be safe wear your mask and those who can get vaccinated and there's a personal shout out my daughter helen will have a, a private art show on this friday a one woman art show virtual and so um, i'm just excited about that and proud of my children who are adulting all right Mayor um thank you mr mayor i i went to the boat show over the weekend at the convention center it was our it was great it was most most everything was inside in air conditioning <laughs> which was nice uh sadly about half half the people there did not have on a mask even though it was inside and um it, you know there were kids there young people old people and it was just really disappointing so um it, it is the law of the land in this county and you're supposed to wear a mask whenever you're inside and it's public buildings and and private buildings when you're in your home obviously you don't have to wear it but you know please take care of yourself we don't want to lose anybody else okay mr rubber yes i'd just like to compliment our pio and the new magazine that we've got going out uh, we're right up there with uh Riceville Beach Magazine and everything else. If you hadn't seen it, it's really, it's really special. I got mine today. Mr. Anderson? Nothing major. I just, it was, I went to um, GFL, the Greenfield Lake Amphitheater last week for the first time since the pandemic. And I know we've had the, li the lights bright downtown and all the new, our new shiny toy, but I'll tell you, that sure is a special place. Um, it, it, it was awesome. So uh, we're very blessed to have two uh, amphitheaters of that quality. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Spears? Yes, sir. I'd like to say a uh, compassionate rest in peace to a Maude Brown young man who was killed on Carolina Beach Road over two weeks ago. Um, hit and run, just left to die. A uh, young entrepreneur, uh, a twin, uh, an uncle, a son, you know, 25 years old. Um, he, was, uh, he was my son's barber. His uh, sister is, is getting married, if I'm not mistaken, this weekend. He was supposed to be in the wedding. Uh, my, my girlfriend is in the wedding. His, he, I'm a, I'm a friend of the family, and uh, it's just tragic. It's just tragic. The, the lack of concern, the lack of humanity that we are experiencing in, in this day and age, and um, I, I just, I don't know. I just can't help but to reiterate time and time again how how just how compassionate we need to be how how we need to not forget um who we are and not just who we are but whose we are thank you mr mayor very good and i just like to like to recognize the passing of miss elizabeth wright that passed away this um in fact her funeral was today and uh, her and her husband thomas wright were very active and 
really started a significant portion of the revitalization efforts for downtown Wilmington with the Chandler's Wharf and Elijah's and the Pilot House. And uh, we're very uh, passionate about um, this community and uh, what it looks like today. And we owe them a great debt of gratitude. With that, thank you for taking an interest in your government. We stand adjourned.